Terribly tardy today. Terribly tardy. But I'm here. We're coming to you on three platforms today. Hello, shorts. Hello, longs? And hello Twitch! Welcome, welcome. Yeah, we made it. We made it. I just had to, like, my hair was messed up. 
I did a little bit of kickboxing today, and whenever like sweat hits my hair, I don't know, it's like this automatic like tangled mess, this bird's nest. Oh my gosh, Chad, I feel like. Yeah, I gotta fix the um. I feel like I might have an aggressive side chain hustle. Oh, side chain hustle. I'm sorry, I'm mixing metaphors, aren't I? She's mixing metaphors. Who knew? Who knew? We're mixing metaphors today, but that's okay. We got a lot to get through today. Norm, uh, Norm McDonald. Norm McDonald, not alive to roast, uh, roast OJ Simpson? Isn't, wasn't that his thing? Uh, no, we're talking about a different Norm, uh, who is still with us. Who is still with us, and he's been busy. He's been busy roasting Mr. Mr. Bucciarati. I think Destiny would like that I call him that, right? That's about the highest compliment that I can. Oh my God, chat. Oh my God. That was the nicest I've been. Oh, not, not, yeah. To make up for like how, how hard I went on him in uh, that last video. I don't know. Um, some of us are here from the premiere this morning. I rarely, I rarely these days get out an actual, um, I rarely get an actual video edited and you saw what happened, right? I was away from stream. I missed like two days, two days of streaming because like I told myself, I was like, you can bang this out. You're a great streamer. You don't have to edit much at all. Your streams are perfect as they are. All you're going to do is clip the fun moments, upload it. People are happy, but I don't know if people are happy or not. Um, I, I'm watching the comments. I pay attention to the feedback. And uh, some of the feedback I got today was like people being confused and being like, oh, cool, live stream. And then they're like, oh, shit, I've already seen this, right? I don't know. I feel like most of my audience had not already seen that because that was a late night stream. Uh, sometimes when things so go so badly, when things go so badly, um, you know, in, in terms of getting things done uh, during the day, the stream does end up being later than usual. And so there's a, a night stream uh, drops and then everybody misses My normal audience misses it. I shouldn't say everyone. Because there are some people who appreciate me streaming late at night. So, uh, yeah, I took, uh, you know, I was going to just um, bang this thing out uh, and upload it. Because um, that's the one thing that I haven't been doing much. I've been grinding. I've been streaming a whole hell of a lot. And uh, what I haven't been doing is actually pumping out those videos. And that's what you're supposed to do for a YouTube channel. That's the model. That's the model set forth by my uh, debate predecessors. Why am I still using their model? I don't know, chat. I don't know. Because I'm a live streamer, primarily, but live streaming is not as rewarding as it should be. YouTube has a love-hate relationship with live streaming. Uh, that at times, they act like they want to eat Twitch's lunch for breakfast, and at times, uh, they act like they don't really much care about streaming at all. And, uh, you know, overall, they don't push out a live video the same way that they push out a uploaded video right so the strategy that you'll see like all kinds of live streamers uh, particularly debate streamers utilize is the uh, strategy where they stream on on their you know on their youtube and or their twitch and then they upload the best parts of those streams and i'm a little bit different in that like i i know how to edit i don't think boston knows how to edit i don't i could be wrong i don't think destiny knows how to edit I don't think that debate uh, streamers generally edit their own shit because they they have somebody to edit it for them. They, they, they you know, they have a whole operation. I got to um, do most of my stuff uh, for my myself. And uh, and therefore, it's like splitting time between editing and between upload, like editing and uh, streaming. And yeah, like I said, I thought that I could bang this one out. I thought that all I had to do is be like, OK, it starts here. It stops there. I did that. Starts here, stops there. Oh my God, that's four hours. Four hours and 30 minutes. I wanted people who didn't get to see the stream to be able to catch kind of like the best parts of that, right? So I started cutting and I started cutting and I started cutting and I realized that there's like a gazillion F-bombs in the middle of that. Yeah, fresh, uh, not fresh, Fit. Fit comes on and uh, he's, he's really mad. He's legitimately mad, I think, right? And I don't know who told him to do this, but yeah, he goes off on, on the chat because his chat is roasting him. That's the thing that's going on with Fresh and Fit that's kind of unexpected, right? You'd expect people to laugh at the ass clowns of the red pill uh, outside of that silo of content, but you don't really expect them getting roasted by their own chat. And they are because they're not 
living by the say they're not walking the walk and, and talking the talk right everything about the red pill everything about what fresh and fit uh does is tries to teach men who don't have a great deal of confidence in their ability to uh you know in their riz let's just say uh teach them how to have riz that's the whole that's the whole scam of puas right you know that's what differentiates incels from puas the incels are like you know, they think they're doomed because their jawline is not correct. Their skull shape is out of whack, right? They're, there's, you know, the, the black pill, right? And then the red pills are like, no, 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 you can fix it. You just got to find an alpha male and uh, be that alpha male's beta for long enough. I guess that's what uh, Fresh is doing with, with Fit. Uh, but but the whole idea, though, is that they, they're, you know, they want to. So like, like I said, there's two different sides to the manosphere. All right. This is oversimplification. Somebody could probably go into it in more depth, but this is as deep as we want to get right now. Yeah, because it's bad for your, it's bad for your everything. I don't know, Chad, it's just bad. Um, you don't want to stare too deeply into the manosphere or else maybe the manosphere might start to stare back. And we, we don't need that. We don't want that. But the two sides, uh, roughly speaking, we got the red pill and that is uh, to teach, you know, defective beta. <laughs> I'm, I'm using their words, right? Defective beta men, how to uh, have some riz, how to, uh, how to you know become a pickup artist, and uh, and then and then because they're like they're all you know the what the common thread is they hate women, <laughs> they hate women, but they have different ways of handling that hatred. The red pill people uh, feel like women are always getting one over on them. Women are always tricking them. Women are always taking their money. Uh, women are always busting their balls or whatever. So they get back by. Uh, you know, by being a scuzzy sleaze lord and, uh, you know, have sex with as many um, attractive uh, women as possible to build up their ego, their, build up their fragile, uh, damaged ego. And, uh, you know, that's how they do it. Right. And the whole thing about it is the red pill is supposed to be they will teach you like fit mainly will teach you the, the alpha, the alpha, the face will teach you how to have that kind of. Um, how, how to have no strings attached S E G G S with uh, as many women as, as possible in order to convince yourself that you now are the alpha. You've learned all the lessons from uh, the big brother figure, the father figure, the whatever figure, and uh, you are now ready to uh, go out and uh, cynically pick up, pick up women. And they're not living that because what you're not supposed to do is get into a situation where Somebody gets pregnant and now you're potentially like on the on the hook. You're you know, it's supposed to be non no strings attached, right? Strings got attached, right? So that is a failure. That is a red pill failure. And that is why I predict that not even destiny can save fresh and fit. But how is everybody? How is everybody? Oh, wait, I gotta um, I gotta move some stuff around here. So that I can see chat. Oh my god, what is it doing? Do I like go all the way up here? Yes, I do. There we go. That's what we want to see. Okay, look, I'm gonna test out. Oh my gosh. That's what I thought. I gotta reset this. Okay. All right, there we go. There we go. Okay, so I can see chat in uh, all possible ways. Oh my god. Oh, thank you, Afroponics. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, I was wondering about that because, like I said, um, there's a bunch of different models for how this is supposed to work, and uh, like I said, the the models are, are generally like set forward by by people like Vosh and Destiny, by channels, streaming channels that have been uh, wildly successful. Now, trust me, I am not trying to emulate other aspects of the careers of, of Vosh and uh, Destiny, but um, the one thing that that you do end up having to emulate is how do you operate on YouTube as a streamer? And my thought is that I stream and then I upload the best parts of that stream 
uh, with maybe a little bit more of a touch to finesse, with a little bit more, um, you know, production value in them, right? In other words, uh, make them like, you know, real videos that compete with, um, because you're on YouTube, right? You're always competing with like other like YouTubers, right? That aren't live streamers and that can have like a higher um, production value. But yeah, that just like, it just causes all kinds of problems for me. Because like I said, I am a random small streamer check and I do not have the resources. I do not have the ability to, you know, I don't have like a whole, you know, team. I don't have an editor and a, a like a full-time editor. And a, uh, I mean, I do have a lot of help though from, uh, you know, from, uh, from the mod team and from people associated with the, the stream. So, you know, sometimes when you get a video, it's from, uh, you know, Zara, Zara decides uh, that she wants to take a, a crack at one of the streams that I did and try to make it more watchable, try to make it more digestible, try to make it, um, more comprehensible and viewable. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of times it's, it's me doing these. So chat is now closed. I'm not sure if that's true. I'm not sure what's meant by that. Oh my gosh. Um, so, oh God, I'm reading from the other chat. That's my problem. That's my problem. I'm all over the place today. Oh my God, we got a raid. We have a raid. Welcome. Welcome to the stream, Adrian Vixen. Welcome streamer. Welcome raiders. You have activated my stand. Spice girl. Yeah, we got Mr. Butcher, Mr. Butcherati, uh, today getting roasted by uh, Mr. Finkelstein, a uh, Doctor Finkelstein, uh, if you will, and uh, and and you know, so like, the Norm's doing a lot. Norm's doing a lot. He's he's like he's all over the place, right? He is on uh, Pierce. He is on Brianna Joy Gray, and he is most certainly on Mr. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. That's right. Um, is is getting like here, chat. This is my dream, though. This is my dream. All right. I want a Crowder Sam Cedar dynamic between Destiny and uh, between Welcome in Raiders. Welcome in uh, uh, between Destiny and, uh, and Norm Finkelstein. Like, right. I want it to be like, cause like, you know how Destiny, oh, maybe you don't know how Destiny operates, right? Uh, you know, if you're like in that circle, if you're in that sphere, if you're, if you're like friends with people, you know, surrounding uh, Destiny. You know, it's, it's kind of like any panel that you throw, any, any, you know, interesting content that you're doing, there is some chance that Destiny might pop up. And uh, this is what he does. This is what he does. He just like, you know, kind of mills about, goes into different streams, has conversations. Anytime uh, somebody's talking about something, especially something that he disagrees with, right? This happened to me once, right? I was, I uh, had a few guests on. I don't remember exactly. Oh yeah, we were talking about Demon Mama. We were talking about Demon Mama for some reason, and he wanted to come on and put his two cents on. And his two two cents were that like Demon Mama should be blacklisted off the face of the internet. I, you know, I got some, I got my own issues with Demon Mama, as as some of you may know. But that's not one of them. I don't think that she's like worse than any you know debate streamer out there. I think she's kind of like the same. I don't I don't think she's that uh, different. Now that's not <laughs> that's damning with some very faint praise there. But but yeah, Destiny's whole theory of uh, like you know she's like above and beyond all other people she must be stopped right i i did not agree with so yeah he uh, happened in on uh, on my stream and it was just the, it was the weirdest thing in the world my my youtube blew up everything blew up but it maybe it blew up with the wrong people i don't know i don't i don't i'm not trying to gatekeep uh, anyone and tell them uh you know if you like this streamer you can't also like me you 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 can watch whoever you watch you can disagree with me uh when you disagree with me you know that's that's all good and and well and stuff but The last raider has arrived. Welcome, uh, Dead End Joker. Welcome, raiders. I gotta put this, um, if I can move this. Yeah, like right there. Is that a good place for that? But yeah, hey chat. <laughs> You're too old for shorts, says Autumn Leafs. That's okay. I started shorts late today. So, oh yeah, I gotta check. I gotta make sure. This is the biggest challenge for me as a streamer is literally keeping up with chat. I don't know what it is about me, but I get a lot of chats. I got a lot of, get a lot of people saying a lot of things and I'm interested. Oh no. I'm interested in seeing what those things are. That's gotta be okay. I didn't label it this time. I think this one's shorts. Yeah, it is. Okay. There we go. Like, 
but yeah, it's keeping track of everyone, keeping track of uh, everything uh, going on, because there's a lot. I got three chats to manage. Luckily, I can combine two of those uh, chats, but one of the other chats, the shorts chat, is the one that I got to keep on uh, stream. So yeah, we're here. I'm, I'm seeing all of your chats. Why are all the YouTube live streams? The streams are trans? Swag YOLO, what are you talking about? The streams? The streams are trans now? I feel like we've got a certain degree of... Oh my gosh, the other thing I need to figure out is... Oh my god, Morbius Dragon, thank you for the gifted membership. Mago Del Rio. Mago Del Rio, you just got weaseled. And I feel like, did somebody else get weaseled earlier? Yes, Morbius Dragon with the gift sub to Afroponics. Thank you so much for those two uh, very generous uh, gift memberships. I keep on saying the wrong thing. It's a gift sub on Twitch. It's a gift membership. But uh, whatever it is, it supports the stream, and I am grateful uh, for it. Remember, uh, yeah, it's only through your support that I'm able to be here and uh, and do those streams, uh, do these streams, and whether it's through Super Chats, whether it's through uh, getting yourself a membership, gifting a membership, or over on Twitch through getting yourself a sub or gifting a sub. Where are we as far as the ad break? we got 20 minutes until the ad break. Yeah, that'll also get rid of the ad breaks over on the Twitch side. Unfortunately, not the same on the YouTube side. It's all very confusing. It's all very confusing, and it doesn't need to be this confusing, but it is. And I'm the one that's left to sort it out. The one with weapons-grade attention deficit. That's right. That's the streamer uh, that you're dealing with. But yeah, we uh, had some fun this morning uh, roasting Destiny. Uh, I don't know. I kind of went hard. I kind of went hard. I didn't realize how hard I went because we actually got some destiny people i don't i don't know if there's like still some destiny people that like follow me from way back i talked to the guy twice didn't agree with him e either time but somehow uh became like a, a niche uh, you could say like a, the glup shitto of uh, of the destiny uh universe right you know how glup shitto is the star wars character that um only the fans uh, only the hardcore fans remember oh, you, know, you don't know glup shitto do you unless you're like a super hardcore star wars fan you don't know you don't know who i'm talking about but Trust me, Glup Shido is the best character in the Star Wars universe, right? Just like I'm the best character in the Destiny universe, right? <laughs> Although, I don't know. I don't know how much in the Destiny universe. I, I kind of, it's kind of better when um, I'm like invisible and, and they don't remember me because my hair color changed and stuff like that. But yeah, had uh, two very unsuccessful conversations trying to come to some sort of agreement with Mr. Uh, Borelli, Mr. Bucciarati, uh, Mr. Whatever you want to call him, and uh, and and therefore I became a alien from Star Wars. Oh my God, chat! Oh my God, fresh fit and baby mamas. That's right, Peter Hopkins. YouTube on iPads is weird. Yeah, I've been hearing people, and I've actually experienced this myself. I was on uh, mobile. Um, earlier, in fact, it reminds me to turn off the stream right now. Yeah, I was on uh, mobile in chat earlier, and I couldn't see chat. I don't know what's going on. It just like it, it like when I when I um when I killed the chat and tried to go back into it, which usually you have to do to get the chat to reload, it wouldn't let me back in. It was just like, would you like to leave a comment? And it's like, okay, this is, stream is not done yet. You know, I can do more than comments. Hopefully, we can do more than comments. But um, I am no comment chick. <sighs> for now three gremlins and a baby that's right let me get on track because we're talking about something different we're not talking about fresh and fetus but yeah this is the vod um yeah i was just going to talk a little bit about um so the the, the nature of the content and, and kind of like put it out to chat what's up current katie good to see you baby destiny is so cursed so very cursed i'm glad people are seeing this this is vamps right this is not a uh ncc job this is not an irene job this is actually uh somebody who knows her way around Photoshop, um, you know, with, with just like, and, and also, you know, the, this is a sick joke. I mean, it's not, not in a bad way, not a sick joke in a bad, like it's sick, like, as in like, it's really, um, it's lit. It's skibbity. It's Ohio. It's phantom tax, Chad. It's a very phantom tax joke. Anyway, um, nobody take a bite out of the baby though. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, the baby is, is destiny, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so I was just going to talk a little bit about like the nature of the way that videos kind of work, um, you know, on my channel now, like, so you're used to with like YouTubers, like people doing prepared content, people writing a script, people recording that script, and then people editing a video together. And uh, that is not what I do. I think I've done that one or two times 
Uh, it's generally not what I do. Generally what I do is since I'm streaming so much, I take part of the stream, I cut it into a segment that's easily digestible, that's all about the same content. Because some people, some people see my streams on YouTube and they're like, what the f is up with this video? Like, what is this video even about? It says fresh and fetus, or it says, uh, you know, it says, it says fresh and, and raw or whatever. And, uh, you know, you're talking about like six different things here. Like what are, she's talking about herself. Like what, what, what's going on with this video? Why won't she get to the content, right? Normally a YouTuber will get right to the content and, you know, it causes so much confusion. Uh, people coming upon a live stream and thinking it's a video, people coming upon a video premiere and thinking it's a live stream. YouTube does its best to keep you confused and it keeps me confused as well. But yeah, we're going to get going here because we got a lot to cover uh, today with, like, I'm telling you, Norm. Norm is all over the place. And here's my here's my dream, right? I was getting to this earlier. Um, I want to see Norm, like, the way that Destiny goes anywhere and everywhere and pops up in random Twitch streams. He pops up on random YouTube channels. He pops up wherever, right? He's like, you know, he's like you. He goes around and watches videos. He watches live stream, except unlike you. Then he demands to get in the Discord and talk to the person. And usually people are like, oh my gosh, Destiny's gonna be on my stream. You know, like sign me up. It sounds like a sounds like a good deal, right? And until you realize that he's offering you a poison apple and you're gonna sleep for a thousand years. And uh, you know, luckily the dwarfs will guard you until the prince comes along and wakes you up with a kiss. That's, you know, my experience, or or you know, you uh you're tricked into uh giving up your voice, uh giving up your soul. Uh, to a sea witch and uh, you're unable to talk and you have to find true love and uh and then you can get your wait do you, do you want your fish legs back or i don't even know how it works with the little mermaid i think you end up in mermaid purgatory for like three thousand years which i feel like i really was i feel like i really wasn't anybody who doesn't think i've been punished enough you are wrong i've been punished enough for doing the right thing but um yeah that's just how twitch works um but yeah, I want to see, speaking of punished for doing the right thing, we got Norm Finkelstein. Uh, if you don't know, Norm Finkelstein has a beef with Alan Dershowitz that goes way the fuck back. Like, right, Alan did something really nasty. He published some shit that was shoddy academic research. Not only that, but it was plagiarized, right? It wasn't even his. Um, oh my gosh, I'm talking about Alan Dershowitz, allegedly. That's the end of the sentence. Yes, yes, allegedly. That's what happened, right? Um, but uh, he, Norm called him out for this on Democracy Now! Uh, if you were here during the right stream, you might have seen that. I don't know how many people were watching, but we covered uh, the original uh, Norm versus Dershowitz once. And for doing the right thing, uh, for exposing Dershowitz for the creepy-ass fraud that he actually is, Norman was punished. For years and years and years, he was not, he was kept off of platforms. He was, he didn't get, you know, his tenure. Like he, he suffered. He suffered greatly. Probably, probably even more so than me. He's like the only one with that claim. Like, right, I've suffered greatly, but not as greatly as uh, Norm Finkelstein. Now, he's a complicated historical figure. He's a complicated guy. If I had him on tomorrow, I would probably have equal number of things to disagree with him about than things to agree with him about. But yeah, his takes on Palestine are pretty base, right? But what I really wish is that since he's become the um, kryptonite for Mr. Stephen Kenneth Destiny Bunnell III, I would love to see Norm start to show up in the same places. Like, let's say that Destiny goes on, you know, JSTALK stream, all of a sudden the chat, you know, in the Nor Norm, Norm Finkelstein shows up and like, hello, Mr. Borelli. I just want to see him follow Destiny around and, he, and Destiny's like, oh shit, this guy again. I don't know. I think that'd be hilarious, right? All uh, um, Sam Cedar and Steven Crowder. That needs to happen, right? So yeah, we're going to watch the uh, this round two of Dersh versus Finkelstein. And we're going to watch uh, Brianna Joy Gray. That's probably what we should start with is uh, Brianna Joy Gray um, talking to uh, Norm Finkelstein. And uh, see what kind of tea that he wants to spill. because. Norm is now in messy bitch mode. God, I gotta figure out how, a way to like, okay. Uh, I hate that I'm missing so much of chat. Uh, Mars Falcon says, Epstein skid marks permeate the inside of Alan Dershowitz's skull. 
he uh, has been even more off the rails since a couple months before Epstein got exposed. Yeah, did we wa we watched the Alex Novell video? Do you do you remember Alex Novell is the person that uh, also applied to be an editor for the Daily Wire? Not for me, uh, uh, Alex Novell. I need an editor, but no. Instead, Alex goes over to the Daily Wire, applies to be an editor, um, is essentially offered the job because yeah, he's a great YouTuber, he's a great editor, and uh, you know he turns them down because he doesn't really want it. He's not you know on, on their side, but like he was just kind of seeing. He was getting as much of an inside glimpse of the uh, goings on. The goings on of wait, where is this? Bad faith podcast is what I'm looking for. Okay, I'll just have to type. I'll just have to put that there. It's um, a true pleasure to be joined on. There. Okay, I'm always worried. Wait. Okay, wait, we got a couple of videos here. Uh, we got Norman Finkelstein unloads on Destiny. Unloads on Destiny. And uh, we also have Norman Finkelstein uh, versus Coleman Hughes on Gaza. So uh, she brings in somebody to debate Norm because Norm likes to debate. He's an absolute beast when it comes to debating, right? That's the, that's the thing. This is his, uh, like I always say this about uh, certain people, like, you know, Ethan Klein uh, loves to debate. Norm, Norm loves to debate and he's pretty good at it. I would not want to be uh, going up against him, even in the Destiny debate where he didn't really function as much as a debunker or a source of information. Uh, he sort of did a no comment check thing. Chat, anybody in here see me on, this is way back, this is way back, but I was on the Hippy Dippy uh, round table, the Hippy, Hippy Dippy uh, panel back before the uh, the, the business with uh, with Dylan started. And um, there was another uh, Twitch streamer named Critically Thinking Vet on there. And it was a weird thing, right? Because I think Dylan had been getting some heat for not like platforming enough, uh, you know, women in general. Uh, it's a sausage party over there. It's a sausage party, you know, on, on Twitch in general and, uh, you know, Twitch politics even more so. So it's not necessarily like specifically like a dylan thing it's it's more of a like a platform thing but regardless he got the pressure and he was like okay i've been getting yelled at to bring on no comment chick i've been yelled at getting yelled at to bring on demon mama let me bring them both on for the same stream right and this was before this was before you know the thing with me and demon mama too right so um yeah, essentially the way that this works is there's like an order and uh, people get called on and, you know, they give their synopsis of the issue and then it goes sort of live. And there's like, you know, somebody saying, you know, there's the back and forth with um, rebuttals and stuff like that. Right. And so I was, you know, in a, I was in a bad situation. Right. I'm on to talk about certain issues that me and Demon Mama both know probably equally much about. And yet I'm getting called out consistently after Demon Mama. So she, she so she goes on and she essentially says like most of everything that I would say. And then I'm on and I'm like, well, what do I do with my time? Well, there's a chud. There's a chud. <laughs> Critically thinking veteran is on there. So um, so I just go after like I just like I just make this guy's life hell. And that's what Norman was doing to uh, Destiny on the um, on the Lex Friedman debate stream. Come on, <laughs> YouTube work. There we go. I gotta say, it made for. All right, so she even even Brianna Joy Gray was uh, entertained by. Uh, I don't know what her relationship with Destiny is like, but she's she's massively entertained by uh, Norm's antics, and that's what it was. Like you know, I was the antics person. Demon Mama was the uh, information person, and I was the antics person. And, uh, you know, people people love that. People love that because uh, critically thinking veteran really needed to be taken down more than a peg or two. And I was able to take him down pretty effectively. Great TV, Norm. Like great I, TV. Let's go. I was cackling when when the when the show dropped, it was a Friday. I don't do rising on Friday. So I was kind of lounging around in bed and I was like, little clear my schedule. I will not be roused <laughs> for the next five hours or two and a half hours because I did double speed until I listened to every word of this and it surpassed every expectation, not just because of the drama and kind of the, the, the hilarity of your obvious contempt for the lack of 
uh, intellectual rigor that Destiny brought to the debate, but also substantively, you know, both you and Muin Rabani were just so thorough and persuasive, and you each brought different things to the debate, different kind of um, attitudes that have had effect working, I think, in tandem to address the claims that were coming from the other side of the table, kind of different um, tonal modes that I think played well with each other. Uh, kind of a good cop, bad cop, if you will. And it was so- uh, One in chat, if you saw this debate, I don't know how much I need to, I don't know how much I need to like rehash of, of the Norm versus Destiny debate. So satisfying and so informative. And you say, okay, it doesn't have, have as much reach as um, going on mainstream news or that you haven't been invited on mainstream channels in the US, but there are millions of views on that video. Please don't tell and me that that's going to ruin <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, MSC Stream says, I was watching some some more news. That's Cody Shoddy. I was watching some more news the other day, and Destiny was on two separate clips. He's becoming uh, my sleep paralysis demon. Wait, are you talking about like when you're like watching something kind of like ab absent-mindedly and it rolls over to something next? It's Destiny. Because for me, that is uh, definitely 100% pod save America, right? If I ever watch a Sam Cedar video and, you know, you know how Sam talks and I'm just kind of, it's very relaxing and I end up, you know, falling asleep uh, while watching Sam Cedar, uh, where do I wake up? Well, I wake up with John and John, John Favreau and John uh, Lovett and uh, who's the other guy, Dan, Dan Pfeiffer. Uh, I, I wake up with, uh, you know, Obama uh, Flax in, uh, in Pod Save America. Norm, it's a great thing. There are millions of views on that video. There are millions of views on your interviews with like um, Jordan Peterson's daughter and Candace Owens. And remember that CNN only gets what, like 500,000 views on a primetime airing? Well, I have to tell you, Marie, who I love to death, I've known him for 30 years. We met in the early 1980s. <clears throat> we had a fundamental clash over what you call tonal mode. Page <laughs> Cut says I watched it five times. Please, God, no more. No, trust me, trust me. I don't want to watch it again. I don't think I even watched the whole thing. We just watched the juicy part. Not to them, but to the broader broader audience and enlighten them and the facts and just ignore the two people, other people in the room. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, maybe you're going to do that. But I am taking my sledgehammer to the porcelain vase. I am going to smash it to smithereens. <laughs> so every time Maureen got into a serious mode as he answered uh, that thing called destiny. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is mood. This is mood. This was my role. And this is the only role I ever got to play in Twitch politics, right? I'm not, I'm not like sad about it. Okay. Uh, you know, when you look at Twitch politics as a whole, it's a, uh, it's a sad, toxic, uh, place. Um, I, you know, can do uh, better than that. I, I have been doing uh, better than that since I've been focusing on, on YouTube, uh, more, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm kind of sad. I'm kind of not really. I don't know. I don't know what to think, chat. I don't know what to think. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, same, same kind of deal, right? You're uh, there with Muin uh, Rabani and Rabini, and, you know, he's um, taking, uh, he's mentioning all the points that you would mention, maybe even a, in a slightly more eloquent kind of way. What are you going to do besides pick up the sledgehammer and smash? Norman smash. You are making this sack of shit. Seriously, that is not going to happen. I, I have not heard her lose it like this before. I watch <laughs> every, oh <my> God. <laughs> every statement of mine was prefaced by you moron. <laughs> Do you know what it means, Brie? Bri I prefer Brianna. Do you know what it means when you spent 42 years Reading every scrap, every footnote, not once, not twice, but three times, because I'm a, a forensic scholar. I'm looking to analyze the text and figuring out 
what is wrong with this argument? I know it's wrong, but why? And, you know, it's a very intensive mental expenditure of energy. And then this guy, three months ago, he boasted about the fact that he could find Israel on the map. He thought that Erdogan was the prime. I actually happened into that Destiny stream. The, the one where, yeah, he was having trouble. I think since then he's been playing this game. There's like a map game that you can play where it asks you, um, you know, either like capitals of countries or to name countries or to like, you know, you see a picture of a country on the map and you got to name that or you see uh, you've given the name of the country, you got to find it on the, the map. But I think I was in there when when Destiny was like, wait, wait. He was he was pointing okay he was he was trying to figure out where Palestine was on the map and he was searching in Asia Minor which is where Turkey is right he was he was a little bit off minister of Israel and he thinks he says he's telling his viewers believe me I've never seen that program never will but people are emailing me Finkelstein be careful he's going to destroy you Finkelstein he's really ready now for you I'm thinking <laughs> Well, so no, there's two different ways that people could be uh, saying that, right? He's ready to destroy you, right? Um, so in general, here's how debates work, right? They, they Stephen, uh, Vosh, you know, any debate streamer, uh, there's an imperative for them to take the W regularly, if not all the time. And, uh, you know, with, with the, 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 that's momentum, that's their growing, that's their, the, the legend of them is increasing. Right. And uh, when you don't take the W, you got to convince the chat it was a W uh, nonetheless. When you can't convince your chat that it was a W you nonetheless, then you go after the interlocutor. You go after the person. You give a reason why, you know, well, yeah, I mean, it looked like Norm uh, kicked my ass that day. But actually, did you know Norm Finkelstein is a terrible landlord? What are you talking about? <laughs> a guy who gets all his knowledge from Wikipedia is going to destroy me? Do you know what an it, what an affront that is? <laughs> what an affront that it's is? It's an insult. So I was determined, nope. And the funniest part, of course, was every time I called him a moron, Benny Morris burst into <laughs> laughter. Benny Morris is on uh, his side of the, right? So it's Benny Morris and Destiny sitting next to each other on the, you know, uh, Israel side, for lack of a better term. And it's... Uh, it's Norman and, and Moeen uh, sitting on the opposite side, on, on the Palestinian uh, side of the debate. <laughs> oh my, okay, so that was amazing. Your intentional, unintentional uh, uh, calling him the wrong name repeatedly. Absolutely, absolutely. Let, let me tell you. And you know, I love the church for not lying. I don't lie, okay? <laughs> After the five hours, I walk out with Moeen and he turns to me and he goes, that was really funny. You keep changing his name. Chad, if you didn't see this part, yeah. Um, they, 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 okay, so they, like, it's a long debate. It's a marathon debate. I think it was like four or five hours. You know, if you think my streams are rough, uh, check out that, right? That's, a, that's a, you know, an endurance uh, race, uh, basically. So, you know, he, Lex at some point says, all right, let's take a break, everybody. You know, go have a smoke, go have a pancake, go have a smoke and a pancake if you're, uh, you know, feeling, uh, you know, a little wild, right? And uh, he, he's, you know, Norm and, and uh, Muin uh, step out, right? Now, uh, what's funny, though, is like, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a class, sometimes this happens, sometimes a really long class, and the teacher is like, we got to take a break, we got to take a break. All right, everybody go get some food, get some water, get whatever you need, have a smoke, have a a, a drink, and, and, you know, be meet back here in, in five minutes, right? Uh, some sometimes people don't leave the classroom. So maybe times people just kind of camped out there. Oh my god! Oh my god! We got hit by the ad break. We got hit by the ad break. Anyway, um, I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, so uh, yeah, that's what Destiny and uh and uh and Benny did, right? They sat there, they stayed there, and they kept talking. And Lex left the cameras rolling, and and it was weird because you could tell what was going on, right? Uh, they felt like they had had the better gotten of them in the debate, right? They were not doing, they were not faring well in the debate. And so instead they tried to, I don't know, make up for it, commiserate. You know, 
suck each other's egos off in the in the in the break with with Norm gone and and uh and Muin gone. It it was wild. I don't I don't know, it's kind of pathetic. Uh your name please? Stephen Bonnell. Okay. Mr. Bonnell, I'm a lot more literate than you, Mr. Burrell. I'm gonna believe that's not this controversial. Mr. Bonnell. This is what I was looking for. This is what I was looking for and I was unable to find was the, the tape where uh he there there's a this is like a mega mix of all of the uh ways in which Norm got Destiny's name wrong during this event. Mr. Bunnell. Literally, Mr. Borelli. Mr. Borelli. The problem, Mr. Morelli, is you Mr. don't know Morelli. the English language. Well, no the commanders respect respect all these Mr. Bunnell. Mr. Morello, can you stop raging against the machine for two minutes and listen to me? To see the misrepresentations that Mr. Bunnell... Let me read Mr. Well, let me read, Morell, let me read, let me read Mr. Let I think I'm going to read one. What's that music? Please don't teach me about the English language. Did you read the case? Yeah. Uh, it is Mr. a highly Torelli, special intent. I'm going to ask you again. Genocide. Yes. Please stop displaying your imbecility. Okay, I'm do sorry not, if you think do, the declaration of the put on, is imbecile. Don't put on public display that you're a moron. <sighs> display Mr. on camera of your putting yours in Mr. books. Mr. Okay? I read uh, the case around <laughs> four times. They just okay. don't show uh, genocidal Mr. Morelli, intent. Mr. So the Israeli Minister Mr. of Finance Morelli, on the 8th of October. War. I, well, you do know I'm how to so pronounce my name. Why are you mispronouncing it intentionally? I'm so it made you into an Italian I'm all so the time. Touched. It may be meaning. Mr. Spaghetti. To you, Mr. Bunnell. Okay, Mr. Bunnell. Who on the Gaza Strip before 67? Mr. Bunnell, don't change the subject. The actual Destiny alternative. Destiny should talk yes, about yeah, making money media, off yeah, of media idiocy. Blitz, blitz. Listen to this. Wait, only this reminds me. Okay, chat. Like, I know somebody. Who's, who is it that always asks me what my favorite Steely Dan song is? I can't pick one. I ask me to pick a favorite Steely Dan song, um, but there there is one song which is like a live recording from somewhere, and uh, you know it's it's hilarious because the guy that they, the hype man that they've got to introduce them gives them this huge like send up like gives this whole you know everybody in in you know uh, like everybody you know in this part of the city everybody in that part of the city you're gonna be sad that you missed this because you missed a goddamn good thing. And then as he's going to introduce them, he's like, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Spectacular, Mr. He can't remember that he's, he's introducing Steely Dan, right? Like he's giving this amazing, amazing, like hype, uh, like introduction to Steely Dan, right? And he can't remember at the time, like Steely Dan is like one of the more popular bands that's out there. So it's like, it's like, but yeah, he, he like. He can't remember their name. This is this is what it's like. Mr. Bunnell is now on. an expert on Palestinian on. mentality. Where it was a good we faith effort. We have a written record. With all due respect. We have a written Mr. record. That's right, uh, Darn Small. That's my favorite Steely Dan song, uh, Darude Sandstorm. Mr. Pop Mr. You can't even read the written record. So I don't know why you're referring Excuse to it, Excuse okay? me? I There's, just said No, I mean like that and also the uh, soundtrack to Battletoads. I think they did a good job on that. 15,000 pages on Annapolis. And I'm sure you cherry quicked your favorite quote I from all of them, pick. okay? That's hey, great. Least, That's Mr. great. Mr. Burrell, at yeah. least I had a quote to cherry That's pick. That's great. All you have is Wikipedia. And all we have is the ad break at the top of the hour, uh, which you might have just experienced if you're on Twitch, right? If you got that ad break, it's three minutes and you're like, what the fuck is this? Understand that you can skip that ad break for free or for $5 uh, by using a... Uh, you know, Twitch Prime sub or by buying yourself a sub or possibly even through uh, the generosity of someone in chat who deigns to give you a uh, a gift sub. And uh, either of those, any of those gets you out of the ad break. You will no longer see weasels. You may see weasels. Yeah, you will see weasels. Weasels positive, uh, ads negative. You will not see ads. That's the important part. All you I have is you Wikipedia. Do you want quotes? They asked uh, for all of Israel in 67. Okay, what do you Mr. think those Bunnell, words were about? You You're not so, going to respond to anything so, I'm saying because you have no I'll answer. I'll respond to you. That's correct. Okay, okay no. Mr. Bunnell. If there, you're, if you're hey, a historian, if okay, you do all this work, okay, things, here, tell me what they said. Something, don't just, Mr. Don't just Mr. tell Mr. me Bunnell, a sentence. Tell me by what Mr. Bunnell. Because they were fake or that maybe 51% of the people were killed. What are you talking about? He said you kept calling him for things. Good morning. What are you talking about? I had no idea I was doing Wait, is this the first uh, Pickrew Destiny stand I've ever seen over here in the shorts chat? 
I I don't think I've ever seen that combination. Yeah, Pikachu uh, De- Keffels fan. Yes, but ironically, but Pikachu Destiny fan. That's amazing. And no, that makes it even I, better. You know, to use your generation's expression, that guy so triggered me. You know, just um. <laughs> wait. So let me see if I can put this together. Pikachu plus Destiny fan. I'm guessing, uh, Dracon debates, that you might have some interesting uh, ideas about a guy named Ray Blanchard. Am I am I correct? Am I anywhere close? <laughs> Just been in the same room as him. I'm sorry. Just couldn't hold it in. I'm not supposed to roast the chatters. I'll tell you, this is the honest to God truth. I'll, I'll get accused of not knowing anything, like uh, like like Norm. I knew I was out of control. I knew it. I was out of control. <laughs> so. I'm waiting for Fridman to stop me. Yeah. So turning to him, and he has this, instead of, I was waiting for him to say, okay, Norman, this is a civil debate. We can't use he, wait, he, wait, did he say he's waiting for Lex Friedman to do that? Or did he say that uh, he's waiting for his, uh, for, for Muin to do that? I was waiting for the lecture because I- oh my god that's the best thing i've ever heard uh dracon debates has no idea who ray blanchard is that's a good thing i did not have the inner wherewithal to stop me. i need somebody else to put on the break and he has this impish grin on his face like he's enjoying no it's just an unfair uh stereotype about uh destiny fans and then, and then Gabby Mars is portling he's not just laughing he's Right. So there was nothing to stop me. I didn't want to go down. Okay, I wasn't going to legitimize him, but I didn't intend on... Here's what I don't understand. Like, right, why was the debate set up that way? Like, what was Lex Friedman thinking? I don't know that much about Lex Friedman. Uh, but I do know that in general, like, right, if you've got... You know... Like... Demon Mama and, and, and No Comment Chick, you might want to bring them on on different debate panels. Like, and if you got Norman Finkelstein and you've got um, Muin uh, Rabeni, uh, you might, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's weird. It's weird that it went that way, right? Because this is like, I'm telling you, right? I've had a similar experience, right? Where, you know, you're going on uh, a panel and, um, you know, uh, essentially, your field of knowledge duplicate duplicates and overlaps with somebody else's, right? In this case, it was Demon Mama, of all people, of all people, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, what are you going to do if they get to speak first? What are you going to do? Like, what is Norm supposed to do in that situation where it, it's like, you know, they could just like hit them from both sides with the same thing? But isn't that more boring than having one person that is there for entertainment and another person that's there uh, you know, for facts, a lot of what Norm was doing anyway was just citing, uh, you know, the, actually the, some of the works of uh, Benny Morris, if I remember correctly. Every other minute of moron <laughs> was not my modus operandi. You know, to use it discreetly. Discreet. No. So. so that's a really fun detail because we couldn't see uh, Lex Friedman's face. He wasn't on camera for most of the debate, now right? He just a grin on his face. So that's useful. And the, what you're saying about Benny Moore is we all saw, obviously. And then the thing was... Yeah, Gregory Hammond's uh, pointing out that uh, for all of Wikipedia's faults, it does have some uh, pluses too. Look, it's an okay place to start if you have uh, no... Uh, you know, if you don't... Like, it's a good place to start, right? If you don't know about a topic at all and you want to get like a sort of a survey, right? A sampler plate, if you will, of that topic then, you know, go to Wikipedia, right? But if you are going to contend with scholars like um, like the ones that were in that debate, I, I you got to go, you know, way, way deeper than Wikipedia. Even way, way deeper than the sources that you're going to see listed on Wikipedia, right? Which is obviously the next place that you go. Yeah, I'm not somebody that like, you know, hates, you know, I don't know, Wikipedia. I mean, it really depends, right? I, I think there are some articles I've seen before that are kind of like guarded by say like fans of that personality like some people who should definitely have a controversy section and uh and do not have one or have one that's more in dispute than it really is you know the facts are, are known about this controversy but you know you wouldn't know that from reading the um 
uh, you wouldn't know that from uh, from looking at the you know controversy uh, section. So yeah, I mean, there's uh, definitely problems with Wikipedia. I think it's a great place to start out if you're uh, you know, if you just don't know um, much at all about the topic, but yeah, you've got to, but I don't know. What part, part of what made it so delicious was despite obviously having these substantive agreements, disagreements with Benny Morris, you obviously like there was a, it was a clear contrast between the respect that you had for him as a scholar and the feeling, the disrespect that you had in Destiny. So yeah, so Gregory Hammond, yeah, you're right. There, uh, Wikipedia tends to be a starting point for Destiny. But given that Destiny's starting point was not being able to find Palestine on the map, um, essentially what he's doing is like using his internet clout to place himself in a debate that he has no business participating in, right? Like Destiny, like, I don't know, needs to take some courses, right? No, Destiny, like, um, I, you can't go from like just literally not being able to identify, uh, you know, a, a place on, on a map to uh, having a meaningful debate with uh you know scholars like uh Finkelstein uh Rabini and uh and and Vinnie Morris it was clear that it wasn't just about I'm mad at someone who disagrees with me oh, no. it really was a more core contempt <laughs> that was rooted in kind of the audacity that Destiny demonstrated and making all of these claims that he knew so little about and which were so unsubstantiated and the lack of respect that he brought frankly to the conversation well the presumption <laughs> the presumption that you can read three Wikipedia entries <laughs> and then say things like, you don't know what plausible, you know, plausible gender, you don't know what plausible means. And um, he just, every oh, yeah. statement of his. Uh, Darswell says Destiny had previously backed down from a one on one and Norman uh, didn't want anything to do with Destiny after that. That was a weird uh, situation. So I know what you're talking about. It kind of sounded to me like, you know, anyway, I didn't look too deep into it, but it, it looked to me like it was a. Uh, miscommunication, maybe, although, yeah, it could have been cold feet by uh, Stephen as well. It, there, there it, he did back down, right? There, he had other opportunities to uh, debate Norm. And look, if I didn't know that, if if I hadn't had Destiny, you know, drop into my own stream like un unannounced before, um, you know, then then I might give that some credence of like, oh yeah, you know, it's a miscommunication, uh, Norm, uh, because it sounded like a time zone thing, or almost like Norm thought that they had set up a certain, uh, you know, certain time. And uh, Destiny was not there, so he's like, oh, see, cold feet, Steven, you know, you're not here, right? But um, in actuality, maybe Destiny was me and indicating like a, a different uh, time zone or something like that. But Destiny, he's he's like everywhere. He lives on the Internet and he's everywhere. And I've seen him pop up at just any any sort of time at anybody's stream. And so it's kind of like I feel like if he'd really wanted this smoke, if he'd really wanted this fight, he could have had it. Now, granted, I don't think he should. And I don't think there's actually any shame in saying as somebody who just recently found out where, you know, where, where Gaza, for instance, is on on the map that you are not ready to um, debate somebody who's written books about it just because you happen to disagree with his takes. The level of presumption, he says. The South African delegation. He says their their application was so irresponsible. He said it was criminal, criminal, the South African application. Then he said the International Court of Justice, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, on the basis of a Wikipedia entry? <laughs> no, no, this is just completely off the wall. And I was determined he's not, I'm not going to legitimize him. You know, Boeing was having these very, Serious coverage? What the fuck are you talking about? Serious? Yeah, it, it worked. It worked really, really well. I should go ahead and introduce you, Norm, since we've been going for like 15 minutes now. If you haven't already <laughs> realized it, I, I'm talking. So, you know, just to step back for a minute and talk about debates and talk about debate lords and debate bros and, and this sort of, you know, tradition, uh, not exactly started by Destiny, but carried forward, I, I guess, by Destiny. I mean, it's the most uh, 
probably famous of the blood sports debates uh people he's in some ways like the last standing some of the people who started blood sports debates some of those nazis are uh you know just have been i don't know like they're they're you know involved in uh inter uh, right wing squabbles and they're not as 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 prominent anymore as they used to be but as a form of content right the issue is that what we've gotten with online debates, what we've gotten with blood sports debates is a gamification of debate, right? And it makes sense because the, you know, the guy driving that uh, discourse in it for a lot, a long, a, a large portion of that time is himself a uh, former Starcraft two esports. Um, I I mean, what's the right word? He wasn't, you know, great at that you know he's not he didn't exactly shine he didn't exactly sparkle at starcraft uh, 2 but i mean like so anyway you've got this situation where um we've taken something that purports to be like a, a search for the truth right and that's part of the problem too is the not being able to disambiguate like effective rhetoric from truth not understanding that you can go into a debate where you're absolutely unequivocally wrong about it and uh, if you play your cards right you can come out looking correct and if people you know are in that silo for long enough they start to perceive truth and falsity through the uh performance of debate interlocutors right that's that's really the issue is that that's that stuff getting conflated with the truth kind of th that's where like the damage comes from that's why it's not just like a thing of like okay well they're over they're doing their content whatever right they're gamifying uh debates no they're they're kind of gamifying truth and that's not cool whether you're talking about like a drama right which a lot of times i mean like you know from the outside it just looks like goofy uh messy shit but if you're one of those pr people you know under the microscope in that drama like it's it's potentially career ruining right so so even in, in that sort of a, a situation, right, where those sort of things are being um, argued about or whether, you know, it's a big issue like Israel-Palestine. I, I don't think that we want to leave this up. It's too big. It's too important, uh, you know, to leave up to this sort of, uh, you know, video game that's been constructed um, as, as a uh, as a content genre. To the great Norman Finkelstein, who is coming off quite a run of um youtuber blood sports mukbang asmr debates now that that see no i'm not a, yeah it, it, it like i don't know i don't know like it can be fun it can be fun but people take it too seriously that's the that's kind of the problem right people think of debate streamers as being uh more serious than like mukbangers and they're we're not they're we're not i don't know i mean i did kind of get my start uh you know in in the, in that realm of content mostly because of just my proximity to certain people um but uh yeah like i said before i mean like my uh you know the way that i upload uh videos the, like the 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 live streams versus the videos is very similar to a lot of debate streamers debates i guess you can call them and not just the debates but uh, your die sheepy uh we're looking at this is brianna joy gray host of uh bad faith this is the bad P faith podcast uh she's also a host on the rising which is a show on the hill uh, the Hill is a conservative news outlet that masquerades as, uh, I don't know, trying to be uh, centrist because they've got a, a host on the left and a, and a host on the right. But yeah, they're very much, you know, thumb on the scale for the right wing. Presence online has been really um, remarkable. It seems like you're, it's a weird thing to say because of the grievous tragedy of everything that's going on and you know the real yeah that is what's discordant about like all this laughter and frivolity and and fun at mr uh borelli's expense is that uh we are talking about a very uh serious situation which really shows no you know signs of abating right in, in terms of you know now there's like more eyes on it now there is a you know a certain the, the the like liberal chattering class which was before uh, willing to say Israel has the right to defend itself is now saying, uh, you know, Biden needs to do something. Somebody needs to do something, right? We gotta, we gotta, we gotta put the put a stop to this. But, I mean, look, if you wanted to put a stop to it, you had to start early, right? It's like a train. If you want to stop a train before it hits something on or someone on the tracks, right? You gotta start hitting those brakes way fucking early. And there were too many people that were way too reticent. 
that either that either you know believed in that whole like Israel deserves to defend itself um, line, or they uh, didn't want to be seen as somehow being pro Hamas, which was essentially what you'd get if you if you argued um, you know around October seventh about about this. You know you'd get accused of being like a Hamas uh, sympathizer, right? So because of that, because of the lack of courage and the lack of wisdom. Uh, shown by the chattering class, right? This thing went on and on and on and on. And now we've got like, you know, tens of thousands of, of bodies uh, piled up. And, and finally, you know, here's, oh my God, chat. I, I don't want to have to use Chapo to illustrate this point, but God damn it. They keep on doing this. Like they're the only ones to pick up on like a certain point. And uh, this time again, this time again, they are the only ones to pick up on this point. Um, let's see, we're um Oh god, no. Okay. Uh I thought this was a clip. All on earth seal of approval for a uh, 17th century uh excellence. Yeah. Or I don't even know if I can find this. Um, essentially, the point that they were making is that, like, it took someone that is known about in the Washington D.C. culinary world having friends dying in in an attack by the IDF. To get the attention of a lot of these people, I, I don't know if I can. It, it might not be worth it to try to uh, mine uh, Chapo for this clip, but yeah, they did. They, they're the only ones who made this point. Of, uh, yeah, people who don't yeah. comply. Yeah, they had sort of like a Lee Kuan Yew type figure who put that in place. Uh, there is a travel advisory for people going to Gay City, so <laughs> you. Know, it's it's just been sold travel off, and you know it's so really more of a. Here. But now there are freaking communists invading. Communists invading radicals. Welcome to the stream. I don't know if I can find it. Uh, you know, it's just kind so of a peaceful up here. Another one. Yo, thank you for the subs. Thank yes, yeah, thank you for subscribing, like and subscribe. An, an advertising rag now. I know. I mean, there's no, there's no journal. Okay, they're talking about the gay city thing. Respect. No more disrespect. I would love. Well, I mean, like I. You can tell uh, them first, how to use I statements. Well, I would love to. I, I, Chessbaiter, thank you for the follow over on Twitch. I would love to remove. Okay, we're not going to find it. We're not going to find it. Uh, I thought it was in a, a clip. It's, instead, it's in a podcast, and there's no way I'm going to go digging through the podcast for that needle in the haystack. But they, they actually do make a good point once in a while. Uh, this is once one of those whiles. Talking about this right now. But it is good, I got to say, to kind of see you maybe having a little fun in the context of that conversation and being validated so broadly, even if it is just in the online kind of independent media sphere, that is where the action is. And I wouldn't shake a stick at that. And I've also uh, enjoyed your increased uh, Twitter presence. You mentioned that you didn't intentionally uh, d misname, <laughs> de dead name, <laughs> um, uh destiny but i did see your april fool's tweet which read mr vermincelli once read a book <laughs> actually april F uh chess Bader says i think the usa lacks a true left democrats are center le center or center right uh republicans especially trumpists are far right or far right uh will this change anytime soon i don't know i don't know it's very convenient it's very convenient for capitalism to have it this way that's the reason that the overton window in the united states is the way that it is because it stays in play um between you know a all-out you know cash grab by the capital class which is you know what the kind of economic uh policies that uh republicans tend to in institute and a weak weak tea um milk toast you know uh, regulatory um uh regiment with, with the with the democrats right that it works out really nicely for for the people um you know th that are essentially bankrolling both sides 
fools. <laughs> oh my god. I see it. 7.30. Uh, so, so this is the timestamp for the uh, Chapo clip. Wow, you know exactly what I was listening to then. We got some Chapos in the... Some uh, Grey Wolves, perhaps, even, in, in the chat. We'll, we'll give it a listen. 7.30. That uh, we did not address on last week's show, but it has been sort of a... I don't know, like, uh, it's been described as a turning point in the uh, Israel-Gaza war. I'm talking about the triple tap of the uh, Jose Andres uh, aid convoy in Gaza, the killing of seven aid workers, including an American citizen. And, like, th this has been, like I said, uh, it's been sort of framed as a turning point, at least in the media management of the war. I don't know if this is a turning point in terms of policy. I mean, like, they seem to have opened up another another border crossing to get aid trucks in but like this this does seem to be yeah it's too little too late mostly symbolic but then you have people like nancy and, and again chat my on to like uh you know just... my issue with chapo is is in general that it's like it's it's very um it's very black pilling it's very dark it's understandable right uh, you know as as uh uh, like I was just mentioning, is there is no real left in the United States. There is no viable um, left, uh, certainly not in electoral politics uh, in the U.S. And uh, oftentimes the the energy that would invigorate a left is redirected. In you know the the right has actually been um, successfully like trying to rechannel some of those frustrations that go back all the way to Occupy, that go back to the two thousand eight financial crisis, right? when people started to see the cracks in capitalism. But if you can convince somebody it is the fault of the immigrant, it is the fault of uh, you know the, the trans person, right? If you can blame somebody else for it, if you can focus their anger uh, somewhere else, that this is, you know, this is what this is how um, you know fascism truly is like capitalism in decline, truly is like liberalism in decline. And it, it's the the fallback position um, to prevent any sort of uh, of leftist, you know, takeover. Say, hey, we have to cut off military. But yeah, it's dark. It's dark, right? It's it's dark to fucking say triple tap, and you know, I mean, this is just kind of uh, how they are. To Israel, but I was just like trying to understand all of this, and I'd like to share. There's an there was an article in um, the Financial Times by Edward Luce that I thought really did a like a, a brilliant job of sort of and we'll get right back to uh norm versus norm versus uh norm uh spilling the tea on uh destiny with brianna and then um there is like he does have a debate with he she brings somebody on for him to debate and uh then uh, destiny responded to uh norm uh, no surprise there and then we'll watch the uh we'll finish off strong with uh finkelstein versus dershowitz part two maybe even get into part time uh one a little bit uh, capture. Was it a bad timestamp? No, I mean, like, this is just Chapo. I mean, he's like, I'm not trying to hide who they are. Um, this is, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I have, I have mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings about Chapo. The, the, actually, the real reason that, that I feel like Chapo is on point sometimes is because it, it's not, you know, because they're so great. It's, it's the, like, you know, the media apparatus uh, so often uh, fails us, right? why like why this moment is different and like you know why 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 people in washington feel differently about the killing of these seven people as opposed to tens if not hundreds of thousands of others so this is from the um this is uh israel's jose andres problem uh this is by edward luce writing in the financial times the subhead is will the killing of seven world world central kitchen workers prompt biden to take action against netanyahu's government it begins like this one of the few high points for me of Washington's grim pandemic lockdown in 2002 was a lunch with the FT that I did with Jose. So, yeah, they're literally reading uh, from the Financial Times here. And uh, I mean, like, this is dark uh, and this isn't Chapo being dark. This is the world. The, 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 the me this is this is just like, you know, this is in Financial Times, right? Because of the rules, we had to do it on Zoom. But even that, that had its upside. The Spanish chef and world-renowned humanitarian was eating at one of his outlets in Virginia Beach. I was sitting in my home office with Mexican food from one of his pop-up restaurants. At the end of our session, I asked what his greeting and goodbye rule was during the age of coronavirus. At the time, people were annoyingly clinking elbows, which struck me as precisely the wrong sneeze-ridden part of the body to be using. Mm. Andre stood up, straightened himself out, stared into the camera, then pounded his barrel chest, shouting, I give you my heart. I give you my heart. 
from almost anyone else, Andre's theatrical gesture would have come across as contrived. From him, however, it was utterly sincere. Very few people have to give their hearts to the extent that Andres does. I have been thinking about him, as have so many others, after seven of his colleagues, what he calls angels, were killed in three Israeli drone strikes earlier this week. Since last October, Andres' has World Kitchen... So you see this? This is an article in the Financial Times. I mean, it is, like, on point in terms of, you know, bringing up the... Um what's going on in, 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 in Gaza and, um, you know, disagreeing with the, the IDF policy and the Israel can defend, should defend itself crowd. Um, but like I said, it's too little too late in a lot of ways. I mean, it's better, I mean, it's better that it's happening now that, than it's not, but, it, and it's also like, what, like prompts that, you know, change of heart. The fact that somebody who is, uh, you, you know, is a great chef, the fact that somebody that you know is a great chef had friends die in the in the conflict that's that's really what's gonna like it's it's sad like i'm glad that you know the tides are changing i'm glad that more people are, are waking up and and seeing uh what's been going on but um it's really sad that it's like literally oh yeah because you know a great chef whose restaurant i've eaten at <laughs> no not me but like you know the art the ar author of the article is uh you know has had uh has lost friends in in the conflict and has supplied 43 million meals to palestinians trapped in that enclave which is almost 20 meals per person i don't have a complete list but i would not be surprised if this exceeds all other non-governmental organizations combined either way it's a safe bet that only UNRWA, boycotted by israel and now the u.s would have supplied more food to the gaza strip than the world central kitchen it, go, it goes on like this but it says here the latest incident has also affected joe biden in a way earlier ones did not Put simply, Andres is a Washington celebrity. He was one of the pioneers of high-quality restaurants in the early 1990s, and in Washington that had a well-deserved reputation for dowdy food. Andres Jaleo introduced Spanish-style tapas food to America's capital. In 2016, his restaurant Mini Bar was one of Washington's first batch to merit a two-star Michelin award. Among others, Nancy Pelosi, the former U.S. Speaker, has nominated him for a Nobel Peace Prize. When I spoke to Andres during the pandemic, he was keeping dozens of local restaurants alive by ordering food deliveries from them to supply homeless shelters, hospital staff, and other essential workers. So I was just very taken. Yeah, I mean, he sounds like a great guy um, and, a, and a great restaurateur. And I'm sure, um, you know, many of the Beltway people in uh, in D.C. Are, are glad to have, um, you know, some some decent, uh, you know, food out there but god it's it's fucking sad that like this is like one of the an example of something that's made people aware of of you know it's only when it uh you know comes home it's only when it touches um somebody that you have the connection to and in this case the connection is like a culinary uh connection and by that description of like why does this matter now it's because he introduced tapas to washington dc and you don't kill someone or you don't kill the friends of someone who, who uh, operates mini bar and Jaleo in Washington, D.C., a, a city mostly known for bad food. Well, I mean, before then, you have to understand they were eating the food of the founding fathers, of the Puritans, and of... Yeah, yeah, they're eating actually the founding fathers in, in many cases because there's just not a lot of food there. You know, they just like to, you know, dig up the like I, remains I, of uh you know famous revolutionary war uh figures and start chowing down there's just not a lot not a lot to eat you know, like whatever weird warm sushi uh they ate in the movie wall street like there it was like pureed turnips and shit so i mean Hard if they're gonna listen to anyone it's it's gonna be the celebrity chef because they're such an insecure dumbass city that the one thing that they have is cool. What do they have, like, hardcore in the 80s? No. It's a shitty city. If The, the DC hardcore scene. The celebrity <laughs> chef can, can fucking... Wait, is, what bands is that? is that? I don't know that much about hardcore. Is that, like, Rite of Spring? And It's, it's not a city. I don't know what bands we're talking about. America's Office Park. If if that's what it takes, I'm I'm down with that. It ha Yeah, it has been, like, disheartening that, like, after... You know, God, God only knows the death count, but like that this was kind of it. This was this was the breaking point for normal countries to to open the floodgates. I mean, because, they, you know, they haven't just come out about this. This is like caused a bunch of 
more normal countries and really like most lawmakers to actually use the genocide word. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, of course, it's terrible, but like you would hope that the tens of thousands that were killed before that would have provoked something. But even on the Israeli side, I think they they do at least recognize how badly they fucked up with this one. Because their response to this is, I mean, it's pure anguish, but also like the like mainstream theory now seems to be that Hamas provoked them. So, yeah, anyway, this is, uh, you know, Chapo uh, yeah, kind of being on, on point as far as like, no, I mean, they are no good at noticing dark realities. That's kind of uh, what they what they do. That it was so peaceful up here, but now there are freaking communist invading. Radicals. Welcome in communist invading radicals. Glad to have you with us. But yeah, let's get back to the Brianna. Oh my god. They're joining on by twos and twos. They're signing up. They're invading in. Welcome in. Can we get three? LOL. He said, I said, what are you doing? Between us, we've read around 10,000 books. And you've read three Wikipedia entries. What, what are you doing in here? And he said, oh, you read books? What a waste of time. That's what he's a waste of time to read books. I mean, the guy is, I mean, he's, he's just like a moron and a heroic. Why read books when you can read the cliff notes? Scale. He thinks that, he claims that he wanted to play, you know, he was saying, Bad Brains was from DC. At the conservatory at the university. Um, Chess Bader says, can we even consider Bernie Sanders a leftist? I mean, not a leftist, right? Uh, it, 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 in terms of what Bernie is proposing, yeah, it is, uh, you know, he, he's more like a sock dim. Steve Nebraska. And, and it seems radical compared to anything else that's going on in politics, in electoral politics, right? Social, socially democratic uh, policies like Scandinavian uh, model, uh, you know, hybrid government is, 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 is seen as radical. And he was, uh, learned the keyboard and the organ. With him. He's the kind of guy who thinks after three months, after three years, three years, he mastered chop chopsticks. Okay, <laughs> he mastered chopsticks <laughs> after three years, and now he's ready for the Tchaikovsky competition. <laughs> I mean, it's just breathtaking. I mean, I'm I'm curious. I'm curious, Norman, how you've sort of been dealing with the aftermath, because as I understand it. He's been on his show um, trying to do some kind of victory lap. What? Um, oh, my God. Okay. I didn't even see this. I don't know uh, why it's not showing me this, but um, iterative growth. Uh, thank you for the uh, for, uh, 4999 super chat. First time seeing your channel. Uh, first time seeing your channel. Very much like your presentation style subbed. Yeah. Thank you so much. And also, thank you for the very generous uh, super chat. Yeah. He hasn't allowed the debate to stay kind of within the four corners of you all being in the room together and has instead, you know, continued to throw grenades, as it were, and claim victory on some of these points, the mens rea point and some of the others on his own show. I'm I'm wondering, are you surprised by that? Have you felt compelled to continue to engage? Would you like a rematch? I mean, how are you feeling about it all? No, I would never have. I didn't want to Is Biden a leftist for his labor reform? Look, he's probably getting called a leftist, right? By by some mainstream Dems, right? That's probably wild to them. They're like, no, we were throwing, remember, we we're going to throw labor under the bus. We'd given up on labor. Uh, we'd made a, a separate piece. So if you don't know, like the history of the uh, Democratic Party is this, right? In the 40, in the 30s and 40s, um, you know, they had uh, the New Deal. Essentially, the Democrats felt enough pressure and understand like that's the motivating factor there. They felt enough pressure from the real left, which was actually uh, active back in the 30s, as well as, you know, the proto uh, fascist uh, forces in the United States as well. But yeah, the you know, the real left was nipping at the heels of the Democrats. The Democrats felt that pressure. Uh, Roosevelt enacted the New Deal. 
not so much to attack capitalism as often as thought, but rather to save capitalism from itself, right? This is, uh, you know, we, we, we roll from there into a Keynesian era where um, essentially um, stimulating the working class is seen as an effective policy because, right, you give these people money and guess where the money ends up? That's right, in the hands of the capitalists, right? And they're also happier, right? Rather, you know, you've got a social safety net, people feel... Uh, more taken care of. They're they're sure that the bottom's not going to drop out from under them, and they start to um you know they they uh they're less likely to question capitalism, right? So that's what that's what kind of paves the way for like McCarthyism and and for anti communism and for flipping over from being like you know anti uh, Germany to being you know anti USSR uh, during like the fifties and sixties. And, uh, you know, then you get to this sort of like breaking point, right, where the Democrats run uh, McCarthy, who is seen as a, uh, you know, a pretty far left uh, candidate, embraces some of the energy of the 60s. And, uh, you know, they, they, they would I, I'm not going to say the, the hippies chat, but uh, understand this distinction. The yippies, OK, is what they were actually called. The yippies were like the hippies, except for instead of like dressing up with, you know, whatever kind of um you know, wild clothes, the hippies would, the, the yippies would, um, you know, put on a suit and tie and they'd go march down the street and then they'd, uh, you know, they, they, they'd canvas for Gene McCarthy, clean for Gene, uh, they called it, right? But uh, Richard Nixon was able to essentially run against the 60s, run against the summer of love, run against the hippies, run against the idea of, uh, you know, lawlessness, like at the Democratic uh, Convention, uh, run against the anti-war movement, right? Successfully successfully right so that's the beginning right and then you've got um you know so, something you know kind of you, you've got like a resurgence i guess of the profit of profitability uh crisis in the 70s you've got the entrance of hardcore money and politics uh in the 80s with some things that went on uh legally behind the scenes and and then you've got ronald reagan now ronald reagan was supposed to be a joke you know how people treated trump like a joke when he first got on the scene Right. He's, he's, there's no way, you know, Hillary Clinton, a lot of people think thought wanted to run against Trump, like like was actively doing things to help Trump, um, you know, seize the nomination uh, because she saw that as a like an easy clap. Right. And for her, that's like even better, because like if you have to uh, you know get your base activated, if you have to really try to win, then you're going to end up enacting some uh, left wing policies that Hillary Clinton definitely does not want to um, enact. Right. And um, essentially, ever since Reagan, right, so going back to, to Reagan and how people thought he was a clown, he was an actor, you know, he wasn't taken seriously, he was a radical uh, in terms of his politics uh, before that, and nobody thought he could really win, but he does win. He wins in 1980, he, uh, you know, he wins in 1984, and uh, his vice president, George H.W. Bush, the dad of George W. Bush, wins in 1988. The Democrats are shitting their pants at this point because they are like, are we never going to win another election? Like we lost to this joke of a man and now we're losing to his wiener uh, vice president because George H.W. Bush was kind of a wiener, kind of a bit of a wiener. Right. And, uh, you know, they didn't like this. So you you got the emergence of something called the uh, Democratic Leadership Council, uh, the third way. You've got a, an emergence of uh, essentially very conservative Democrats that are like, yeah, we are going to win again. But here's what we're going to do. Right. We are going to. Emulate Reagan's policies, and you can even see this with Obama, the way that Obama venerates Reagan. Right. is disgusting. But, you know, we're going to em emulate like, you know, Reagan's policies, which are bullshit policies, batshit policies. Right. Uh, supply side economics like does not does not work. It isn't intended to work. It's intended to you know, throw more power and throw more, um, you know, tax breaks uh, towards the rich. Right. Um, but you, the, at this point, the Democrats become afraid of their own shadow and they start uh, taking like whatever the Republicans, you know, policies are and just moving like one or two steps, one or two like inches, one or two millimeters to the left of that to give the um, the, the donor class essentially an alternative. Right. If somebody comes along like Pat Buchanan and you think the guy's too radical, which, you know, he's a fucking foaming at the mouth racist. So, yeah, I would say he's pretty radical. Right. Then you can put your money. You can put your donations. You can put your support with us, the Democratic Party, and we'll give you pretty much what Reagan gave you. So um, since then, that strain of the Democratic Party has been in control. 
and it, it really has not uh, let up. Like Biden isn't a deviation. Hillary wasn't a deviation. Obama, as much as he um, his message might have been a de deviation, right? He, he might have sounded like he was signaling something different. The fact that he's running against Hillary Clinton, who is considered inevitable and was supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to back off, right? It's Hillary's got next, right? Obama said, uh, no, I don't recognize that. I think I got next. And indeed, uh, he's such a good speaker. He was able to no, then again, also Hillary's very uncharismatic. So anyway, he he wins. But none of these people that have you know run for president have been a deviation. Bernie would have been somewhat of a deviation. But you could saw what happened, uh, you know, with his uh, his uh, both of his campaigns, uh, particularly the second campaign in which all the other candidates drop out at the same time, throw their support over to Biden to ensure that Bernie will not get the nomination. You know. What a different world we would be living in right now had the Democrats had some guts and, and had some foresight and, and, and seen Hillary Clinton for the shit sandwich, uncharismatic politician that she turned out to be. I think it takes a phenomenal, um, a phenomenally bad politician to actually lose to the likes of Donald Trump, even in a year where everybody hates the establishment. But no, Hillary was obviously the wrong person. Uh, to run in uh, 2016, and we've been paying for it ever since. Let me be clear about that, because I take the life of the mind seriously. It may not be a first rank or a second rank, and maybe not a third rank scholar, but I take the life of the mind seriously. I should hope I do. I invest my entire adult life in it as a complement to my politics. I do believe, because I'm part of a a tradition where the those who led the, the movement they also possess not only courage um sassy sasserai is bringing up the fact that yes hillary d did indeed uh win the popular vote yeah and if the democrats had some guts right then there might have been uh you know an attempt to abolish the electoral college but very impressive mental power they all graduate at the top of their class. They all were widely read, not just in economics and politics, but in literature and in art. These were, for me, growing up, they were stupendous historical figures, not least because of their erudition. So, I mean, I'm speaking of what Marx himself, mm. uh, Engels, a Lenin, a Rosa Luxemburg, a Trotsky. I mean, these were first rank minds, not just historical political figures. These are first rank minds. I mean, it's still daunting to me to read them and try to uh, try to uh, digest intellectually what they have to say. When Lex Fridman first proposed... Yeah, the Electoral College was created uh, to protect the institution of uh, slavery. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of anti-majoritarian uh, mechanisms in the uh, United States democracy, right? Which, like, I don't know. I feel like it was a democracy in, like, ideal only. Like, it's an ideal that's never really been attained. Um, you know, back in the day, it was only white men that could vote. Uh, you flash forward... And now you've got uh, essentially a second, um, you've got a second uh, primary that runs in, in terms of who gets funding, in terms of who gets donations, which, which you need to be successful, right? There's, there's always at least, uh, there's always a lot undermining any sense of democracy. And I would say it's in the na very nature of trying to combine something like capitalism with democratic principles, right? It's like trying to combine a uh, fox sanctuary, which is great. Have you ever seen, you know, Save a Fox? I mean, great content. Sometimes we like when we need wholesome videos, uh, we watch Save a Fox, right? But I think that the Save a Fox, um, you know, uh, staff would, would probably, uh, you know, be careful about uh, having a chicken coop in the midst of the, uh, the yard where the foxes run free, right? If you, you have chickens and you have foxes, then essentially you have some very well-fed foxes. You don't have chickens for very, you don't keep your chickens for very long. And that's what democracy is. Democracy is the chicken.
that that is just inherently right because what what is you know capital beyond just the accumulation of uh, a value extracted um from workers you know surplus labor uh extracted not just from like one generation of workers but from generation after generation after generation what does that represent it becomes leverage it becomes power and capitalism is a tool for accumulating power into the capitalist class and uh and, and in some ways you know uh, to to reform something like the feudal nobility in, in terms of the capitalist class right so um so you're always going to even if you have a situation in which some um some kind of public programs exist some kind of a welfare state something to claw back some of that um some of that you know you know dead labor right that's been accumulated uh you know is instituted something to make the material conditions of of workers slightly better uh even in that situation you at least in the united states you've never had a situation where actual leverage was being clawed back where it was like you know the the workers were becoming more powerful and Miss Vamps, thank you for the resubscribe. Oh my god, thank you for the resubscribe. Where are we at? Oh my gosh. And thanks for reminding me that at the top of every hour, there is an ad break on Twitch, right? Many of you may have experienced this already. It's three minutes of ads. If you no longer want to see those ads, you can get out of that for free or for $5 with a Twitch Prime or with $5. You could also potentially be gifted a, um, a sub on Twitch, although that sort of thing more likely to happen if you're active in chat. The, 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 he proposed it with destiny. I said, that's not going to happen. I don't even, I wouldn't even debate a person with one name. You know, I'm not debating, with, <laughs> I'm not debating Cher, and I'm not debating <laughs> destiny. You know, that's not, not going to happen. So he then came back to me a few weeks later and he said, How about if you go on with Benny Morris? I said, Fine. You know, Benny Morris. Um, David Wish, uh, Vusish, sorry, says, Imagine thinking Norm did anything in that debate besides insult Destiny. I mean, that was what he was here for, though. Right? Imagine taking Destiny seriously, though, on the issue of Israel Palestine. I have to turn that back on you, uh, David. I'm sorry. I, I don't normally roast chatters, but. Politics are appalling. In fact, they're, they're beyond appalling. They're, they're murderous. They're genocidal. Yeah, he advocates nuking Iran. I don't. I, I think that's off the spectrum. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, actually, during the debate, I kept saying, let me read your quote. And he was mm -hmm. very nervous about it. He was very, so I never got mm -hmm. a chance to quote him. Yeah, he advocates. And, and when the question of quote unquote civilian casualties, he said, well, they, they voted for it. They elected that government. In other words, they have what's coming, yeah. which is an interesting yeah. idea. Since uh, Israel is carrying out the genocide, and the population voted for that government, well, you, you carry, you, you get the point. In any event, so then he said, "How about Benny Mars?" I said, "Of course, that's he's serious, and I know his work very well." Um, and then he says, "But with destiny," and I said, "Well, look, if I say no to that, I'll make me look like a coward." Then I'm afraid to debate Morris. <clears throat> I, I figured I said, look, if he wants to bring along that thing, that's fine. You know, that's <laughs> that's a, a choice, and uh, I'll go on with mooing. But I would never have done it. Why would I do that? Yeah, it's tough. It's in this ecosystem. I mean, you don't. You're a scholar, and you have written the preeminent book on Gaza, and you have a career that you can stand on on its own. But in this media space for people who are trying to make a go of it, the way you do it is by sort of leveling up and engaging with people who have bigger audiences than you. So a lot of people do feel compelled. And this is interesting because I got chat, uh, you know, because some people in shorts chat, you know, want to question uh, you know, Norm's uh, seriousness based on his lack of treating destiny with any seriousness, uh, which which is funny in and of itself. I guess you don't know who this guy is, but that's OK. I'll, I'll forgive you uh, for that. Uh, but you've got at the same time, Brianna uh, bringing up the clout game, 
right? Which is something that you would assume that a Luddite like Norm, like somebody that's, that refers to his computer as his electronic typewriter uh, would be you just completely alien to him. And yet somehow he does get it, right? Somehow he he's roasting, you know, Destiny, not uh, so much on an intellectual level, you know, which would essentially be putting, um, you know, Destiny on an even, uh, you know, playing field with, with him, which he never was. But, um, you know, on a, on like a, on, on like a, um, like on a very immature level, right? On a content level, let's just say. And now Brianna's like, talking about the the clout game of like you know you've got somebody with a bigger platform you can do this you can do that to entertain folks simply because they have a larger audience and i don't think that's a completely self-serving project if the goal is to competently explain to the other person's audience why the person that they like is so wrong right i've seen nathan robinson's theory about accepting these sorts of debates is that basically it's okay if you know you're going to win so yeah, you've got a situation where Destiny is only on this playing field with Lex Friedman uh, and uh, Finkelstein and, and the rest of them because of his clout, because of his audience size, right? Where he bypasses the need to actually know what the fuck he's talking about um, by, uh, you know, his his clout and um, and by his ability to wield rhetoric, not understanding, not knowledge, not anything real. But to, to sound like he knows what he's talking about, this is very much the Ben Shapiro uh, playbook, right? Ben Shapiro uh, talks very fast, speaks, I, I guess, well. And by the virtue of that and the, the fact that he uses words that are like, you know, slightly above the reading level of his audience, he is taken as an intellectual. He's the cool kids philosopher. And like. You know, there's just no reason to give him that respect in the first place, right? I don't know. Like speaks well. You know, that's a relative thing. Good point, uh, darn small. That's a that's a a relative description of how he speaks. But the damage you can do to your movement if you are unprepared and you get owned on that big platform, as of course, no deaf left channels it will invite Destiny on. Is that true? Real John Doe. I've had Destiny on. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, so. I've had Destiny on, I've debated him on cancel culture, and he had no fucking answer. He didn't even engage, right? If you wanna if you wanna accuse like Norm of bad faith for not engaging with your intellectual giant uh Destiny, then I'm I can turn that right back around on you, right? He's got nothing to say. Right? He wants to run this sort of straw man version of cancel culture where it's like he's the one who's the victim. He's the one who's suffering, right? And who's the who's the evil? Uh, oh, it's Demon Mama. I'm sorry. Somebody with like a, a, a tiny fraction of your audience, right, is out there. But she might say that you're transphobic, which you fucking are at some point, and that might cause you to lose a sponsorship. So Destiny's the goddamn uh, victim of it. Meanwhile, like wh when you're talking about cancel culture, you we're never talking about the cancel culture that's let's enacted against marginalized people all the fucking time all the fucking time stuff that destiny does himself in terms of his blacklist right trying to blacklist demon mama who like i will tell you i'm not a friend of demon mama she hates my guts but um i won't say that she's like worse than other debaters out there she's just she's just the same and somehow she was singled out and he tried to absolutely step on any kind of career that that she might have had and i think somewhat successfully right i think somewhat successfully her her growth her audience is sort of limited to the little bubble that she's in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's just funny to hear him like make that argument and, and have no no real comeback to, the, the, you know, the fact that him claiming cancel culture, him claiming himself as a victim of the woke mod, mo the woke mod, the woke mob is is it's freaking stolen valor. It's he's he's a bitch baby is what he is, right? He's a crying screaming bitch baby of a man not you but others i think do feel drawn into these kinds of debates and that's why they're so popular and why there's so many takers and i do frankly feel See what like i mean this was a public service that you did it even though i completely bitch baby. empathize with your revulsion at the idea of it um you you did so well. i have there's the ad break actually there is a clip that i happened to just come across on the internet you you were saying that you 
uh, aren't being invited on to mainstream platforms, but the largest podcast in the world recently uh, had something to say about Destiny that was very much in line. Oh, Joe Rogan. Of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Coleman Hughes was talking to Joe Rogan on his podcast, I guess, about his new book and stuff, and Destiny came up. And I wanted to show you this clip. Uh, ben Shapiro should d debate Destiny. Oh, my God. I know they, they did. The two of them they, they did debate. <laughs> did they really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. They about did. Um... I feel like we watched a little bit of that. I, I got to be honest, though. I was putting my chat to sleep. But now they're a freaking communist. I was putting my chat to sleep watching the Shapiro versus Destiny uh, debate. I'm sure that they did disagree on some things. But wow, they they they're more alike than uh, than uh, than you you know you would think. Uh, yeah, thank you for the sub, uh, Jay Main, and welcome in. Who hosted them? Was it Lex? Was it Lex? Was it? Uh, I could was be. Was it Lex? I think it was Lex. Yeah. I'm wrong, but it could, I think Lex hosted a debate like two months ago. That's well, he had a debate a couple of months ago, but it was a Palestine. No, Israel no, that was separate. Debate. I yeah. also saw that. Oh, that was like the did. four hour. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that guy debates everybody. Yeah, it's so he's so ridiculous. He does yeah. his, a Wikipedia search and then just starts going after things like yeah. he's an expert. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it, it's a it's a fun time. It's yeah. a really fun time. Yeah, it's a fun it's time for watching people flail. No, he, he took your line. Are you are you secretly friends with Joe Rogan and gossiping on a text thread about how Destiny just reads quotes off of Wikipedia? <laughs> he boasts about that. It's not, Does he really? It's not as if people are making it, you know, pinning that on him. He gets all this information. When I kept saying in the course of that debate, I kept saying, where'd you get that from, Wikipedia? He didn't deny it. That is where he gets his information. I very much doubt he's ever read a book in his adult life. I don't. Okay, I won't go that far. I won't go that far. You know, people... I mean, I'm sure Destiny has read a book in his adult life. Young, young men who live in their parents' or grandparents' basement, and they shovel between... Um, they shovel between video games and Pornhub. And in between... The Excuse me, Norman. It's called Corn Hub. Destiny. <laughs> and, Norm, and they're brutal. They're, they're so protective of him. It's amazing that the moment... Yeah. Like, I wonder if he realizes that part of Destiny's like outsized presence on the platform has to do with him being a very early adopter of the format of live stream. And uh, having been on the internet since like the beginning of of time, not exactly, but you know what I mean. Like he's 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 old school. He's, uh, oh, I wonder if he understands that. Like yeah, like it, it, even amongst um, you know, internet debate bozos, uh, Destiny is is kind of uh, very very much a naked emperor. They, they want to, you know, it's a it's a phenomenon. If you don't mind my saying. It's a phenomenon like Rush Limbaugh. It was always a kind of perplexity. What exactly was his appeal? And the appeal was, here was Rush Limbaugh, not very bright, a very large man, not very- What is that phrase? Like in the- uh... In the realm of- I don't know. There's so there's some anyway. Chad, I feel like it's an ableist phrase. Um, something about like in the realm of the blind, uh, the man with one eye is is king or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like this is this is Rush Limbaugh, right? Like for an audience like Rush Limbaugh's audience, for an audience like Ben Shapiro's audience, right? Because it was so peaceful up here, but now there are freaking communists invading radicals. You don't actually have to be that smart to appear to be that smart to to people like that, right? Uh, the boops, thank you for the follow on uh, Twitch and uh, what's going on on YouTube? Ryan uh, Forpas, thank you for uh, subscribing on YouTube. Attractive. And suddenly he's whining and dining with all these important people. So it's every, if you don't mind my saying so, every white loser projects themselves <laughs> on Rush Limbaugh. I could one day be like him, you know? It's and aspirational. 
Yeah, and that's the same thing with that thing named Best. And thank you for the tier one sub, the boops. Welcome to uh, Weasels of the World. <laughs> you've got weasels, is what I'm trying to say. Post your, post your weasels. No, you've got a lot more than that. You've got all, all the emotes. His, his cult following, they're very protective of him because they see themselves. They see themselves in him. This is right. He's a relatable. Oh, my God. Like, I'm starting to get more insight on, on the Ben Shapiro phenomenon. In his shoes one day. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could all imagine yourself doing, you know... That's how I understand the phenomenon, because I've never seen such protectiveness. Personally, I wish he would take his cult with him, go down to Guyana, bring along the Kool-Aid, and do it. Jim Jones. Yo, you can't fucking say that, Norm. You're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Not <laughs> Norm. Norm's got the trousers of Satan on today. Okay. <laughs> really, that would be doing a service to humanity. Norman. Okay, look, I, I will say you and I have had this debate before, and I think one of our first. Don't put your real name on the internet. Says if you listen to Destiny or Shapiro, you've already lost. True. The only way to win is to not play. Stations together, where I I do have I think a complicated relationship with kind of academia and credentialing, and there's a part of me that finds it appealing to have an every man who's self taught who and then and there is real information on the internet outside of Wikipedia and who is able to cobble together genuine knowledge and apply himself rhetorically in a way that is persuasive without all of the trimmings of being in the ink club. Um, and I think that's a kind of approachability that is positive that someone oh, might- Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, um, actually Afroponics and Zara both making the same point about uh, Norm not necessarily being great on a lot of issues. And we'll get to those when we get to those. Um, you know, most recently his, his Palestine takes have been, uh, what's, uh, relevant, but yeah, I am aware of, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny that like as much as, uh, destiny and, uh, and Norm, uh, butt heads hate each other's guts, you know, Norm doesn't respect, uh, destiny and, and, and destiny like hates him for it. Uh, they do have one thing in pro in common, right? And that is their self victimization in uh, some sort of claim to cancel culture and being, being victims of cancel culture. A Twitch streamer says in a way they never would have tuned in to a John Mearsheimer. Yeah, we, we'll, 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 we'll have time to get to that. I, I just haven't really wanted to talk about um, other aspects of uh, of Norm's uh, career uh, since, you know, this everything started in uh, or, or restarted really in, in Gaza. Let's say just because the tone of it is more accessible. Like, I, I think that's a good thing. My my biggest qualm with destiny is the substantive politics. And I did find the moments where he just. Oh, yeah. People have been saying something about like his his Ukraine takes or owned um, thinking it would be appropriate to drop a nuclear bomb or the you know insistence that the number of deaths were vastly overstated. Those those kind of moments that just reeked of inhumanity was what made me develop real you know, contempt, contempt for his perspective. Um, I hate to have to say this, but this is not Candace. Uh, this is not Candace. We're watching uh, Brianna Joy Gray um, talk to Norm Finkelstein. To be said, Brianna, people bring different levels of knowledge to different topics. That's perfectly understandable. I would not debate climate science. I, I would not do that. You, you, what can I tell you, you know, when it comes to 99% of topics that are of, uh, are, are of human concern, uh, we all do the same thing. We defer to expertise because there's no way we can master 99% of those topics. There's a certain element of humility. When he, we're talking about the, the, the question of, uh, it was the same thing with Coleman Hughes, by the way. Is there somewhere that Norm's takes are consolidated? I mean, I don't think so. I don't think so. Question of the horrific conditions in which the people of Gaza had to live. And, and maybe that's for the best right now, right? 
Uh, uh, just, just really you know, happy. Norm is an imperfect person. Uh, Norm is a complicated historical uh, figure, and uh, you know, he's not one-dimensional. He has uh, thoughts on a lot of things uh, that maybe he doesn't uh, isn't quite the expert. Like he's even saying this right now, right? That he would maybe be kind of useless in a debate about climate change, right? That you need somebody with expertise on that. He's not that guy, right? I think there's some other areas where he has weighed in. Uh, in which he has maybe equally uh, bad uh, takes. But again, uh, you know, because of what's going on right now in Gaza, you know, this is kind of sucking up all the oxygen. We will get to, you know, other aspects of, of Norm uh, when we get to them, but uh, but not for now. 1991, uh, already in the early 2000s, uh, people very diverse places on the political spectrum, very different because places. Because it was so peaceful up here, but now they're there are communist invading you radicals. A Baruch Kimmerling, a sociologist at the Hebrew University, he described... Oh yeah, good point. Afropodic says he's not great on uh, intersectional issues, gay marriage and trans issues. He's also pro-capitalist. Oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, my grandparents aren't perfect either. Exactly, exactly. Gaza is the largest concentration camp ever. If you take Igor Island, who was the head of Israel's National Security Council, he described Gaza as a huge concentration camp. It's an awful place. The British economist described- God, it's so, it's so weird. I'm always tempted uh, when somebody in uh, YouTube Shorts chat uh, says, what is this channel about? What are we talking about? What is this stream about? I'm tempted to go into it, but uh, just, just understand that we're streaming on Shorts as well as a regular YouTube stream, as well as a Twitch stream. And uh, if I were to rehash like the you know purpose of this channel and the subject of this stream every five minutes, as some in uh, YouTube Shorts chat would uh, like me to, then uh, we'd never get anywhere. We'd never get anywhere. But maybe maybe someday I'll do a Shorts only stream, right, where I can just talk to uh, chat. Is it, that seems like what what Shorts kind of wants. It's a toxic dump. But I'm trying I'm trying to balance all of your interests, right? Trust me. And then you have this thing come along, and he says. What's your metric? What's your metric? First of all, to my knowledge, that thing is still struggling with long division. So with this <laughs> presumption, with this presumptuous, what's your metric? You know? I said to my friend Moeen, the only metric he knows is the one he read off his Peter meter. If you know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what a Peter meter is. Is that like a, is that like a something that, that somebody straps around their schlong? And like, what what is a Peter meter? <laughs> you can leave, you can look that up. <laughs> uh, look up Peter meter. Kate. Wait, 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 no. Okay. The other thing it could be is like, isn't there also the Peter principle? Um, the Peter principle, if I'm not mistaken, is that everyone rises to their own level of incompetency. So it's a way to explain what, like, you know, uh, management in, in a company and how oftentimes uh, the person in charge of a uh, certain part of the company, maybe not the best qualified person uh, for that. I don't I don't know. Does anybody have some explanations for me? Yeah, long division. What is the long division? Oh my god, do we have to ever rewind that? Like, I feel like he was making dick jokes and it just went over my head. And I can't have dick jokes going over my head, if you know what I mean. Spectrum, very different places on the political spectrum. They were describing Gaza as, if you take a Baruch Kimmerling, a sociologist at the Hebrew University, he described Gaza... He kind of lulls you to sleep and then he makes a dick joke. The largest concentration camp ever. If you take Igor Island, who was the head of Israel's National Security Council, he described Gaza as a huge concentration camp. It's an awful place. Uh, the British economist described it as a toxic dump. And then you have this thing come along, and he says, what's your metric? What's your metric? First of all, to my knowledge, that thing is still struggling with long division. So with this <laughs> presumption, with this presumptuous, what's your metric? You know? I said to my friend Moeen, 
The only metric he knows is the one he read off his Peter meter. If you know what that is. <laughs> Do I need to look up Peter meter? Does anybody Peter meter? Yeah, I think you're right, Autumn Leaves. It's definitely like a, a schlong hey, reference. YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder. Um, okay, so there is this other, you know, he does bring on, so they're talking about uh, Coleman uh, Hughes, who uh, recently went on uh, Joe Rogan's, and, uh, and they both kind of uh, roasted Destiny, and this is, uh, I guess, does she bring on Coleman Hughes for Norm to debate? Is that what's going on here? Let's take so a look. Coleman Hughes. This is a shorter, this is a shorter um, piece of content here. Yeah. Who knows as much about... Gaza, as I know about uh, particle physics, he says, well, if you look at, if you look at um, infant mortality rate, and you look at- Oh no. Uh, oh, Zira, Zira knows what this is. Peter meter, male member measuring. Yo, let me see if I can show this on, uh, on stream. This might be interesting. This might be interesting. Mature content. Yes, I'm over 18. Oh no, this is definitely not going on my stream though. It says view NSFW content. Um, Let's see if I can glean the glean it seems like glean is the a weird word to use here oh my gosh okay wait can i show i feel like what this shouldn't be nsfw this this shouldn't be nsfw right this is not problematic wait i'm looking at this and there's no way it, it definitely had like one of those um you know nsfw blur filters on it but i'm looking at it And uh, I think I can show it to you, right? I don't. I don't think there there should be a problem with showing you the Peter meter, even though Discord seems to think I got to be eighteen to look at it. Um, you got to be eighteen to watch my stream anyway, so I think we're okay. Okay, so this is a Peter meter. Uh, guaranteed to be the perfect Peter meter. Uh, lay it down, boys. Okay, so it's a ruler with a particular shape to it. A particular shape, if you're noticing right. And, uh, you know, on the low end, we see 95% uh, imagination. We see seen better days, but not much. We see just a teaser. Uh, we see woman's home companion here at, like, what? Like, five, four or five uh, inches, maybe? Uh, a little bit longer, six inches. We got a secretary's delight, seven inches for large girls and small cattle. Is that what it says? Okay, that's this is getting Voshian, right? Uh, eight, we got home wreckers, the home wrecker size, right? Uh, nine, we have uh, for barroom bedding only. I'm surprised that it tops that. Wait, is this like, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, it tops out at nine. Uh, wow. Just a teaser. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, that's the Peter meter, I guess. That's, that's, that, that's Destiny's metric is, uh, well, yeah, I mean, he's right. He's right. Essentially, um, you know, Destiny is not engaged in anything approaching an intellectual enterprise. It is very much a measuring contest for the Richards, for the Richards. But that's a Peter meter in case you were wondering. Anyway, let's get back to uh, Norm Finkelstein versus Coleman Hughes on Gaza. See, he says, oh, Gaza is, an, Gaza is a developing country. That's how he described it. Ask, you can check it. It was on that program with uh, Norm Dwarman. He described mm. Gaza as a developing country. I spent several hours uh, the other day looking up basic, the most basic proxy health measurements in Gaza. Life expectancy, infant mortality, under five mortality. These are, these are arguably the three most basic 
snapshot pictures of how a society is doing. And um, it, you know, there isn't amazing information out there, but so the CIA World Factbook has life expectancy in Gaza at 75.6, which is in the 46th percentile of countries in the world. It has. Okay, so now right off the bat, I'm wondering how this is measured. Is this like correcting for infant uh, mortality or? As infant mortality as at 14.87, which is in the 43rd percentile of countries. Now, I don't know. I, I don't know what he's what, what what metric he's reading off of, but I feel like it's missing something. If, if you're getting, you know, uh, I think, you know, Finkelstein is the sort of the, the great chronicler of Gaza. And if he has if he knows this information to be wrong, then um, I would I would love to, you know, hear why it's wrong, uh, because it may be wrong. Yeah, it's the CIA uh, fact book. But it's, it's worth noting those are both actually above average for the world's population, right? If you don't just look at countries, but you just treat everyone in the world on the same continuum, those are both above average. Uh, okay, and then there was uh, the Palestinian Family Health Survey in 2010, which was done by UNICEF in partnering with a Palestinian, sort of the Palestinian uh, Central Center for Bureau, Bureau of Statistics. And they have under five mortality at 26.8 out of a thousand now the global average at that time in 2010 was 51 so this is much better than the global average the global average today is 37 or 38 better than the global average today and, and the world has gotten better in the past 13 years right and then <clears throat> I looked throughout Finkelstein's whole book on Gaza he has no data on life expectancy in there, no data on under five mortality that I can find, but he has infant mortality, which, uh, and, and he cites one study on infant mortality among Palestinians in Gaza that puts the number at 22.4, but that's for refugees only, which is slightly not representative, but let's assume it is. 22.4, based on Finkelstein's own source. The global average at that time was 34 significantly higher and 26 today um, and the paper was called increasing neonatal mortality among Palestine refugees in the Gaza Strip so every single one of these metrics one of which is from Finkelstein's book paints the picture of Gaza's basic health statistics on wanting to make dick jokes yeah Finkelstein's book the Peter principle statistics as better than the global population average so on the one hand, we have a set of facts that Finkelstein, you know, strings together that paint the picture, paint a picture not that far from a kind of concentration camp. On the other hand, you have the most basic and significant health proxy measurements that paint the picture basically of a middling developing country. You know, like... like yeah, but most countries don't have a country outside of them talking about putting people in that country on a diet, right? This is the way that, um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, that Gaza has talked about, um, you know, in, in Israel, like a purposeful attempt to restrict the goods that can get into Gaza uh, and effectively reduce the average, you know, caloric intake, right? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that sounds pretty significant. Mexico or, or, the, or the Philippines, uh, and, and in some ways better than the global average. So when you talk about like these euphemisms, like, you know, putting them on a diet, cutting the grass, mowing the grass, as in like every so often we're going to kill off, you know, uh, men, men of, of quote unquote fighting age. I would really want to ask Finkelstein to reconcile these two, uh, these two pictures for me, knowing that it is possible to recite a set of facts that are each one checks out, but you're fundamentally lying about the basic picture. So there's a simple, a simple example. If you look at infant mortality rate and life expectancy for Cuba, for Cuba, it's slightly higher than the United States, slightly mm -hmm. higher than the United States. 
Does that mean the United States is a third world developing country? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that Cuba is a first world industrial, um, uh, an industrial uh, power? Is, is that mm -hmm. what it's meant? Literally, literally, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, literally, of economic reports put out by UNCDAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the World Bank, the IMF, FAO, on Gaza. It's like unbelievable. And they all describe Gaza as being a human catastrophe. It was a premeditated human catastrophe. The, the world's leading authority in the subject is Sarah Roy of the Harvard Middle East Center. And she got her undergraduate and graduate degrees at Harvard. She knows her stuff, okay? I was just rereading the, uh, rereading, I have it over here. I was rereading the introduction to her standard work, uh, the de-development of Gaza. And she shows systematically over a period how Israel systematically de-developed in layperson's terms, wrecked Gaza to make it unsustainable. Okay, and then along comes Coleman Hughes, and then uh, that thing called Destiny, and they no! me metrics. You know that well, thing called Destiny. What's your metric? Oh, you're so smart, Mister. <laughs> whatever your name is, Vermin Shelley. You know, it just Vermin Shelley. It just it's like. I poured over those reports. I poured over them. And they're very, very detailed and dull. You know, World Bank reports, uh, IMF reports, they're very boring. I pour, and a guy, he plucks two statistics. And now, what's your metric? And then the whole issue came up. So he's talking about destiny here, right? Of starvation in Gaza. And I said mm -hmm. at that point, one quarter of the population was on the verge. I just quote on the verge of, on the verge of uh, famine. Now, at that point, it was already famine. On the verge of famine, and they start laughing. They thought that was so funny. Benny Morris and uh, Destiny. He says, oh, "I called him this. That thing called no, that thing called <laughs> Destiny." And uh, the artist formerly known as Stephen. He says, "How do you know that?" How do I know that? Well, I know that because every agency is saying it. You say, oh, now you're deferring to authority. Yeah. When you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you turn to those who do know what you're yeah. talking about, what, you're, what they're talking about. And I said, I don't know. I don't expect that you have. But if you ever go to look at how Starva hunger, starvation, and famine are classified. It's a very complex formula. I've tried many, many times to commit it to my memory. So I said to him, it's a very complex formula how they do that. If you just go right now, go to FAO, the uh, food, uh, food and, oh God, food and agricultural organization, and just look how they calculate a uh, famine. It's a very complex formula. And all he says, all they, all they do, well, actually, Mar is there to his credit. When I was saying it's a, he was nodding. He knew enough to know that, yeah, these aren't simple terms. Even today, who was it that was quoting? I was just reading somebody who's, uh, who said, famine is a scientific term. It's a very complex, complex formula. That, uh, it's the IPC, uh, that IPO or IPC that puts out the formula. Oh, and shit. It's a very complex one. And then to have to argue with somebody. Genocide deniers and flat earthers, but have you measured it yourself? Has not a clue. Not a clue what he's talking about. Was, you know, as I said, I took it as an affront. Now, you might say, well, why didn't Moeen and why didn't Benny Mars take it as a front? First of all, I didn't think Benny Mars cared very much. Yeah, Benny Morris was remarkably 
was remarkably passive. I mean, I leveled mm -hmm. very serious allegations at him. And have you spoken to him afterward? Had, had well, you had any communication with him since? It's an interesting. As serious as the allegations that you leveled at one Alan Dershowitz in the early 2000s on Democracy Now! Story. I was determined uh, not to shake his hand. Now, you mm -hmm. might think that's trivial, but it comes from my upbringing. During the war in Vietnam, there used to be debates between liberals and people like William Buckley, uh, who was the arch and the exemplary conservative in my generation. William and I'm Buckley. trying to think, who would have been the liberal? Like, I feel like I've seen Christopher Hitchens debating uh, William F. Buckley, maybe Noam Chomsky, not, not exactly a liberal, but... And he had a very famous program, which is worth it for you to watch on YouTube. It's called Firing Line. And it's worth it. You, it will, you'll find it. Okay, I mean, yeah, it. yeah. I mean, I should probably check out. Uh, oh, d d d d d Vidal, Gore Vidal, Gore Vidal. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Sasha G. I've definitely seen uh, Gore Vidal on uh, fi Firing Line. I don't look for me, chat, like my uh, touchstone of, of politics is actually the uh, McLaughlin group. Are you familiar? Are you familiar? Chat? Or is anyone in chat familiar with the McLaughlin group? You're familiar? Familiar? Wrong! Wrong. You're not familiar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, anyway, he's, uh, anyway, it's, it's a mood. It's a mood. <laughs> it's a mood. To some extent, you'll find it riveting. Now, he had on a lot. But I mean, I don't know. M McLaughlin was, oh my God, I didn't even know, like, right um, until, like, after the guy was dead, that he actually had some pretty serious allegations of some kind of harassment, uh, some kind of workplace, you know, harassment uh, going on. Uh, he, he, all I remember is that he, like, talks over people and, uh, and, and, like, Eleanor Clift, the Newsweek magazine editor, uh, never gets a chance to say anything. Like, there's, like, it's like Pat Buchanan, Eleanor Clift. I don't remember. Like there's anyway, it's been different people over the years, but it's like this weekly panel. It's a panel show, right? It's it's literally like the hippy dippy for political journalists, I guess. The liberals. But instead of Dylan Burns, you have uh, John McLaughlin, who is like a fucking trip. Like the liberal John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist. Or the yeah, he himself is like all over the map throughout his career. I think, I don't remember, did he start off as like anti-Vietnam War and ended his career as like pro-Trump? He's, he's just all over the place. Liberal Allard Lowenstein, okay? And they would argue over the war in Vietnam. They would argue over the war in Vietnam. And then at the end... Oh God, okay. So we got you baited. Good job, Brianna. Good job, Brianna's editor, right? I truly thought, based on that thumbnail, that we were going to see a... Uh, you know, knockdown, throw out, uh, a knockdown. Wait, what is it called? Knockdown, throw down. Wait, no, what's the word for it? It's not knockdown, throw down. It's like knockout, throw down. Yeah, I think it's knockout, throw down, uh, fight between, uh, Norman and, uh, and, and Coleman Hughes, but it's not to be. And hug each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the betrayal that I felt, uh, you know, seeing pictures of of contrapoints eating uh, dinner with the, the likes of uh, armored skeptic shoe on head, and the uh, the rest of the right wingers. And I remember why. And look, I don't hate contra. Okay, Ob obviously, Chad. I mean, I don't have the wallpaper with me uh, right now, but I was very inspired by uh, contra, and and I think that some of her content is like the best. Um, you know, example of like, you know, her decrypting the alt right. I don't think there's been like a better uh, video uh, doing the same thing since that. So obviously I have a lot of respect for Contra, but yeah, that wasn't maybe not the, the best moment. And like, look, even if, um, even if it doesn't really mean anything, right, it sends a message to your audience that this is pro wrestling. And when it's serious issues, you know, whether it, it it's, um, you know, feminism, trans rights, um, economics, whatever, right? Then it, it it sort of sucks to see that. It sort of sucks to see that, like, at the end of the day, right? I mean, that's that's what I can't take seriously about a lot of Twitch poll, right? Like, like Brianna Wu's, you know, canvassing 
uh, organization, right? You've got uh, Destiny, you've got uh, you got Dylan Burns, you got Loner Box, and you got Counterpoints. Make it make sense. Make it make sense, Brianna. Oh shit, we got some Brianna, don't we? Watching it. At home. I don't know if we'll have time for it today, though. And my mother did not like that. We're talking about death. Ophelia says, I'm old enough to remember that now deleted video of ContraPoints drinking wine and hanging out with Blair White on stream. I never saw the ContraPoints versus Blair White debate, but I did hear a lot of people talk about it. You know, we're talking about the estimate. No, is she hanging with those people, says Sasha G. This was a long time ago, and uh, she's a different person. Or remember, ContraPoints was really friendly with Vosh for a while, right? And obviously, uh, that, that is not you know how she feels anymore. She's a different person, fundamentally, chat than uh, the woman in that bathtub uh, during her canceled video, right? Where she's just like completely, you know, camaraderie of the accused, right? Uh, I think she's she's recognized um, that there is a responsibility for content creators and that maybe she didn't always, uh, always, you know, meet that in entirely. But she got this thing in her mind that a lot of people, right, have like when they're worried about being canceled, like Steven was when he talked to me, uh, they have this idea that, like, they can never back down to the woke mob, right? The woke mob is this fucking monster. It's a dog. It's a it's a beast. And if you show it any fear, you it will consume you. It will it will eat you up. And I'm sorry, but that's fucking paranoid ideation. I don't I don't know what to call that. Right. That's not that's not reality. Right. These people on Twitter do not have the power to like, you know, <laughs> Limits are between two and is Shu on head still a thing? Yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Three million Vietnamese were killed. We're talking about death and destruction. And you think it's just an intellectual debate? Okay, yeah, this is the reality, right? And this is the problem with Steven's content, right? It wouldn't really be that big of a deal. They could just do their own thing and you either like it or you don't like it. You either watch it or you don't watch it. If it didn't intersect with with real life, right, if it wasn't affecting, you know, people's opinions and it's going to be more and more, not less and less. Like a lot of people take like online uh, political space and, and they uh, they denigrate it like the online left has never done anything real. OK, that's true. Right. Real life activism, local activism can uh, do things that, that you could never do from an online uh, space, you know, like organizing uh, whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something, it's something you do on the ground. It's something that you do with your, your friends and neighbors. Right. But, um, at the same time, we got to recognize that this is going forward, going to be more and more the place where narratives, where opinions, where, um, you know, reality, or at least people's perception of that reality is, is crafted. So it is, I think it's important to fight for, I think it's important to fight for. And when I see people treating it like a goddamn video game it makes me a little bit sick uh did natalie actually do that wait did she take blair white to task or did she uh she was in a picture she was at some con right i mean like look on one hand it's understandable and on one hand like if i had ever been you know as big as 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 natalie was i'm sure i would have made you know some mistakes um too i i would have you know, if I ever thought I was wrong, I would have tried to apologize. I don't have this kind of complex about uh, cancel culture that, you know, people like Contra and, and Destiny, you know, had. But um, like, I don't know, she's a complicated historical figure. And, uh, you know, and, and she's also a moving, uh, you know, she's she's also evolving, right? She is not the same person uh, that she was when she was doing streams with Vosh and uh, you know, sitting in a bathtub, uh, you know, drinking whatever out of the bottle and, and saying boo hoo, poor me. Right. I think she's I think she's changed a lot since then. And at the end. A bear hug. And that left a deep memory in me that I would never be part of that kind of. Uh, that kind of ambiance and milieu. And so I was resolved I would not shake his hand. He said things which are so, you know, he said, uh, 
Gaza, Palestine. Okay, so chat, you know, like the I always I always relate everything to this, but I think there's a lot of Sam Cedar fans in this uh, chat, so maybe you'll maybe you'll appreciate it, right? Uh, this is similar to Sam's situation with Temple. If you don't know, uh, Temple invited Sam to come out and uh, be in studio with him during COVID right? at around the same time as, as Vosh would have been. Uh, you know, Vosh uh, flew out to Temple's skate mansion and, and did a debate with him, right? Um, Sam Cedar got the invite too, but I think that he he assumed that it could be done remotely. He assumed that it would be done like through Zoom or some similar platform. And that's not what Tim Pool had in mind. He has this thing where, you know, if he's going to debate you, he wants you to be his guest. So you feel kind of obliged to treat him in a certain way. And, you know, he, you're at his house. He's, you know, remember what he said to Emma, you know, like what I can't believe she didn't want to come out for uh, sushi with the boys. You want to have sushi with the boys? You're supposed to have sushi with the boys. If you don't have sushi with the boys, it's because you're not doing what Tim Pool is doing, which is recognizing that at the end of the day, you are like the sheepdog and the wolf from the Looney Tunes cartoon, right? You may be uh, violently fighting each other during the day, but when you clock out, you're both friends, right? And Sam's not about that. Um, Sam, Sam is not... Uh, there's, there's like a degree, there's, there's a level to which, um, you know, people like Tim Pool are, are uncomfortable with somebody going to like, and, and that's, you know, pretty well described by Sam Cedar's content on, uh, on David Rubin. Right. And, uh, if you don't know, Sam did, I don't know, he's probably done upwards of like a hundred videos on, on Dave Rubin because Dave Rubin is such a good case study of this, like leaving the left kind of grift. Right. And uh, Dave Rubin wanted a certain narrative to exist about him, that he hadn't left the left, that the left had left him. And, you know, it just it got under Sam's skin. And he took a personal affront at that. And he decided that, look, when people search up Dave Rubin, they're going to find our videos and they're going to know who this guy is. Any sort of like self-serving narrative that he tries to create, any sort of false history that he, start, he tries to write for himself, I'm not going to let him get away with that. And t uh, that's anathema to people like Tim Pool, right? He crossed a line. Sam crossed a line there, right? He broke kayfabe. At the end of the day, it's supposed to be, you know, you're all working for Vince McMahon and you pretend to hate him and you, you rage against him and, you know, whatever in, in the wrestling, um, in, in the ring. But, you know, you're, you're he's your boss. And, uh, you're not going to go against his orders. If he says you take the fall, you take the fall. Sam is not somebody who takes the fall. And uh, Norm is not somebody who wants to live in the, the, have that sort of locker room like fraternity go on outside of content. Right. He is critical of destiny because he really doesn't like what destiny is doing. It's not an act. It's not, a, a you know, it's not a it's, it's, it's not content. It's real. Right. And that's the difference. That's the difference. And that, that's why it's so frustrating uh, dealing with people who have gamified things like debate, um, gamified um, you know, speech and, and ideology and uh, and, and aren't uh, treating it with the seriousness that it deserves. Indians are all animals and they should be locked up in the cage, you know, sort of stuff like that. A lot, not just a little. It's not a passing comment. A lot. Benny, Benny Morris did? Yeah. Mars Falcon knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised by that. I mean, he horrible. seemed horrible. So does Iraq 121. He seemed like kind of, you know, what do you what do you call it? A liberal Zionist. Like he seemed much more measured than measured. Let's say Dustin. We're back to the Peter. What is it called? The Peter meter. You know, if you you go to uh, Benny Morris, um, Avi Arishavit, um, Arishavit. S-H-A-V-I-T. There was a famous interview he did in 2002, 2003, something around mm. it. And he said, yeah, they should all be around it. They're all animals and they should be put in uh, cages. Yeah, literally. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm very wow. active. So, and then the stuff about nuking Iran. Yeah. And so I was determined not to shake his hand. I walked in. I did not look at him. We sat down at the table. Moeen was out of the room at that moment. And he wanted to break the ice. So he just said, so have we ever met before? 
And I said, no, actually not. We've debated each other, but it was a <clears throat> video. And then I was pretty tough at some moments in the debate with him. At the end, he came up and he extended his hand to shake my hand. Uh, one in chat if you've seen the chat logs between Destiny and Kefels. Anybody see this? Like, so during the whole time that Destiny and Kefels were at each other's throat, uh, Kefels was secretly communicating with Destiny, and he released um, at least some of those logs. And it's surprising, right? It sounds like the kind of conversation that like opposing wrestlers would have behind the scene, right? It's like, you know, I am saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm describing you as, as like an evil influence online, but uh, zero. So some people haven't. Oh, my God, we might have to go over that sometime. Yeah, it was kind of wild. It was kind of it just sort of blew my mind um, that Kaffels was trying to have a collegial conversation with Destiny behind the scenes. So, I mean, this doesn't actually put, put um, you know, Destiny in as bad of a light as Keffels, right? In in terms of, um, you know, her her wanting to use him as a enemy, as a, uh, but, but almost like in a theatrical sort of way. And like, it's, it, he, I think he does the same thing to some extent. But even that maybe was like a step too far uh, for for De Destiny. Really did hate her at least for a while, and then when she became, uh, I, I think you know she was, he threatened uh, legal action, and and that might have been what sort of changed her attitude, uh, changed her tune. But uh, you know since then uh, they've sort of they've they've you know come to some sort of an understanding, right? They're not, uh... and yeah, like wrestling exactly, Rohak exactly. He was he's a of diminutive stature, very large, very large stomach. Oh my God! What the fuck, Norm? You're gonna spat shame Destiny? I did. I shook his hand because he was so. Wait, wait. This... I'm sorry. Were we talking about somebody else? We're not talking about Destiny here, are we? I don't think he. I mean, like maybe Destiny's a little bit skinny fat, but like anyway, let's not let's not be fat phobic here. Um, wait. What the fuck? What is Norm talking about? Did I just like come zone out too much and? He introduced somebody else to the conversation. And he seemed kind of avuncular. At the end, he came up and he extended his hand at some moments in the debate with him. And then I was pretty tough at some moments in the debate with him. Is he talking about Benny Morris? Is that what's is that what I'm missing? Did he switch to talking about Benny Morris? At the end, he came up and he extended his hand to shake my hand. And he seemed kind of avuncular. He was he's a, a diminutive stature, very large, very large stomach. I did, I shook his hand because he was so disarming in his passivity. It was like he didn't really care. Mm. He didn't really care what he was saying. And it was as Muin, I was commenting this to Muin, and he said, yeah, he was so passive. Mm. I'm, they're talking about Benny Morris. There's no way that this applies to Destiny. That's got to be Benny Morris that they're talking about. Very surprising for me. Hey, you All right, so I guess you can get more on uh, Patreon, if I'm not mistaken. This is Brianna's channel, uh, Bad Faith, her podcast, right? Uh, she used to do this with Virgil Texas, former uh, Chapo alum. Uh, we don't know where Vir 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 Virgil Texas has dropped off the uh, map, though, since the uh, you know allegations, uh, you know, grooming allegations uh, came out after him. But uh, I, th I, th I, feel, I feel like I remember the last time I, I don't know if it was like her Twitter or if it's her YouTube. There were there, he's like listed somewhere, or he was, he was like more, more recently than you would imagine. 
Uh, but anyway, yeah, this is, uh, you know, what Brianna's uh, got uh, going on. I don't always agree with Brianna Joy Gray, but uh, I do think that she is one of the more interesting, uh, you know, interlocutors out there. So I'm always interested in, in, in what she's, uh, you know, what she's saying. But um, yeah, this is uh, she talked to Norman Finkelstein. Uh, usually what she does is she has a long conversation with somebody. She uploads. Um, she uploads like two clips, I think, usually. So we got the two clips of Norm Finkelstein. I think there's more on her Patreon if you want to check that out. Yeah, he's got to be talking about Benny Morris. That's right. There's there's no way. Yeah, that's right. That's chat. Chat knows it. OK, so we got one more thing to go over, but it's kind of like a thing that I want to make sure people understand. Right. There is a history between these two men. And I'm talking about. I'm talking about Norman and Alan Dershowitz. Norman has got a lot of reason to. Detest Alan. In fact, a lot, you know, like right, there's there's no shortage of reasons to hate uh, Alan Dershowitz. He is one of the people that I, I oh, my God, I better not. I better be careful what I say. He, what, he was like Epstein's um, attorney. I can say that for sure. I seem to remember something about flight logs, although I'm definitely not going to make that as a confident statement. But, that, but I, I, one of them was flying around with Epstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't know, Chad. I'm, I'm very. Uh, very reticent to expose myself to any sort of uh, legal. Danger, but. Uh, but yeah, this is Alan Dershowitz and uh, Norm Finkelstein. Let me see if I can, because I got to check in with um, what is up shorts chat. He's describing uh, Benny Morris says child alpha. Mr. Masa Gali, Mr. Masa Jelly, uh, isn't it exhausting moving that goalpost? Yeah, I think so. Destiny should talk to what Brianna Wu? Oh no, Brianna Joy Gray. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's see. I need to. I need to find this right. This there. So yeah, this is uh Pierce Morgan uh bringing on Norm Finkelstein and uh Alan Dershowitz, and they hate each other. And I I don't know. I think the best way to describe the origins of that hate. is to revisit an encounter that they had on Democracy Now! back in uh, back in the early 2000s, probably even before YouTube was a thing, if I'm right, this is why if this if this looks like shit, this is why this is going to be why. Wait a minute, did they debate three months ago? OK, so yeah, he's calling uh, Pierce Morgan is calling this part two of uh, Finkelstein uh, Dershowitz. Uh, I thought the reference was. I thought the reference was to the uh, yeah, because they debated on uh, democracy now, and that's where Norm like exposed um, Alan in terms of uh, both his like sloppy scholarship and uh, in, indeed, uh, what, what he claimed was uh, plagiarism and, and what, you know, I, I was inclined to agree with him what was plagiarism. There we go. Lively debate on democracy now. So I don't know if we have time to watch all of this uh, right now, but I want to give you the. Oh, no. Why do they have music that's. That is definitely not copyright free music. How do they even get away with that? Um, I mean, maybe maybe 2000 and uh, whatever was a very different. Does it? Do we have September 2003? Yeah, yeah, I guess copyright law maybe hadn't really gotten. To where it is now, but yeah, we definitely can't. I feel like they still use that. I feel like they still use that um, that song on Democracy Now. What is that fame by David Bowie? 
refer to the United States. The New York Times reports he gave the impression that he believed Washington is endangering world peace with its foreign policies. The Washington Post reported Annan and Chirac's addresses received enthusiastic reaction, while Bush received tepid, almost perfunctory applause for... This is literally Amy reading the news, so I guess this was, what, part of... Is there a cat in my room? Yes. We need out? This always happens. This always happens. She sneaks in my room while I'm off stream, and then I'm streaming, and I hear a noise, and I'm like, I thought I was alone here, but no, I'm, uh... His presentation. Let's try to. Successive Israeli governments have refused to disclose how much they spend on settlements. Haaretz says it compiled the figure after three months of research, including interviews with dozens of government officials and experts. And yesterday, President she might need to be let out. Bush told the 58th session of the United Nations General Assembly, quote, the Palestinian cause is betrayed by leaders who cling to power by feeding old hatreds and destroying the good work of others. This comes days after the U.N. voted 133 to most appellate lawyers, Felix Frankfurt, a professor of law at Harvard Law School. His articles are published in The New York Times and other publications. His books include Chutzpah, The Vanishing American Jew, Why Terrorism Works, Shouting Fire, and America Declares Independence. We're also joined by Professor Norman Finkelstein. He is author of four books, including The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. His writings have appeared in prestigious journals like the London Review of Books, the Index on Censorship, the Journal of Palestine Studies, the New Left Review, the Christian Science Monitor, and others. He is also author of Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict. His latest book is called The Holocaust Industry. Today, a debate. We're going to begin with Professor Alan Dershowitz. Welcome to Democracy Now. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, why don't we start? Um, now, like, I believe that that book the, 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 by Norman is the one where he talks about... Um, is it the one where he talks about uh, Dershowitz's uh, shoddy scholarship? With you laying out the thesis of your latest book, The Case for Israel. Well, I wanted to write a progressive liberal case for the two-state solution and the state two-state solution, which I think that most Israelis favor and have favored for a long time. I dedicate the book to uh, Professor Aaron Barak, who is the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, and for a reason, because... I argue in the book that no country in history faced with comparable threats, both external and internal, has ever tried so hard to comply with the rule of law. I compare Israel favorably to the United States it's in this regard. Its courts intervene actively uh, in support of Palestinian rights, um, even during fighting and wartime. During the Jenin events, uh, the Israeli court enjoined um, the Israeli military from engaging in, in certain actions which, in its view, violated the rule of law. The Israeli Supreme Court has banned the kind of rough interrogation techniques that are now being employed by the United States in, in Guantanamo. Um, Israel is the only country in modern outside. history that has never deliberately and explicitly retaliated well, against under the those bed. who attack its civilian targets. For example, during the Six-Day War and the 1973 War and the 1948 War, its own residential areas were bombed by Egypt, by Syria, by Jordan, 1,600 shells lobbed into West Jerusalem. Israel never bombed Amman or Damascus or Cairo. They have, of course, bombed areas of Beirut and in the process have killed innocent civilians. But there's an enormous difference between doing, for example, what the United States and England did in the Second World. She can stay in my room as long as she doesn't pee. War, uh, bombing Dresden or Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that is deliberately targeting civilians and going after the way the United States did in Iraq, of which I am very critical, but nonetheless what the United States did, going after military targets, knowing that they're going to kill civilians in the process. And so myself, I oppose the, the settlements, I've always opposed the settlements. Since 1967, I've opposed the uh, occupation. I think Israel made, in my view, a terrible mistake in 67, what it should have done is it should have made border adjustments pers pursuant to UN resolution. I feel like this is, we're going to hear some different stuff from Dershowitz when we check in with him on, uh, 
on Pierce. Let's see what uh let's see what uh Norm had to say. Norm had to say that at the top of the hour there's an ad break. Oh my god. And I realized it too late. I realized it too late. Where is Waluigi actually? That's a good question. Where did Waluigi go? Um, that's not normal for Waluigi to be missing. It does with a book. I read the text. I went through the footnotes. I went through it very carefully. And there's only one conclusion one can reach, having read the book. And this is a scholarly judgment. It's not an ad hominem attack. Mr. Dershowitz has concocted a fraud. In fact, Mr. Dershowitz has concocted a fraud, which, amazingly, in large parts, he plagiarized from another f fraud. Now, I found that pretty shocking. I found it shocking coming from a Harvard professor. I find it shocking coming from any professor. Now we have to cut oh, off at one no, point. No. I just want to warn everybody here that although I, I'm not a litigious person, mm -hmm. when you make allegations of, I'm of prepared plagiarism, to, I'm, I'm when you make allegations of plagiarism, them. that's a technical that's right. term I agree. which has great legal implications. I agree. And, uh, you know, I can't obviously sit quietly by and, you and okay, accept well, let's, an allegation let's look at the of, evidence. Of, let's, of plagiarism. Let's, All right, well, let's look at the evidence. Just, Who is the plagiarism Okay, from? let's look at the evidence. <laughs> In the first two chapters of your book, you extensively reproduce all of Joan Peters' pages in her book. I read it carefully. In 1984, Sh show me, show me I'm one going sentence. to show you. Show me one sentence I am going to show you. Okay. I think I have, I think I made available the charts to you. No, I, I have no, you've shown me I, nothing. I, I I, 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 this is wild. This is wild because like, I mean, democracy now, uh, like many other, um, you know, political talk shows, right, is, is also a place where people with books go to promote their books. And, you know, I mean, you could see uh, Dershowitz and, and Finkelstein uh, both had books at the time and they're you know coming here to promote those now i don't know what Ch chad does uh does dershowitz know he seems surprised he see he seems a little shocked let, let's start with that. That's okay. a categorical wait, lie. Alan, wait, 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 what you're hearing is, now on radio is that a claim that Mr. Finkelstein made available to me certain charts. No, that I is a categorical lie. No. Okay, okay, Mr. Dershowitz, I think you had about five minutes time. I wasn't mm -hmm. looking at the clock. If we're going to have a civil debate, you're going to have to remain. But it's not going to be a you're debate going to about have me. To, Let me going, be very I'm clear not debating about that. you. Okay. I have no interest in you, Mr. Dershowitz. Right. None at all. I'm interested in the scholarship, and I'm interested in the facts, so and I'm I. interested in your book. Now, in 1984, one Joan Peters published a book called From Time Immemorial. The book was universally recognized by serious scholars to be a fraud. Without wanting to toot my own horn, I'm widely recognized as the person who exposed the fraud. I know that book inside out. I read it at least four times, and I went through all 1,854 footnotes. I started to read your book, Mr. Dershowitz. I then came to chapter one, footnotes 10, footnote 11, footnote 12, footnote 13, footnote 14, footnote 15, footnote 16. All of the quotes are from Joan Peters. They are so from Joan Peters, that you have a long quote here from Mark Twain. Okay, so now this is just, just he's going to destroy him here. This is 24. Mm -hmm. I turn to Joan Peters, page 159 to 60. The identical quote from Twain with, with the ellipses is the, in the, is the, the ellipses. Twain quote, is the Twain quote wrong? With the ellipses, the Twain let me finish, wrong? sir. No, no, but the, the key with is the ellipses <laughs> in the same places. The identical quote from Twain. This is H-Bomber guy before H-Bomber guy. 
with the ellipses in the same places. It's been widely I then, quoted, as yeah, you know. Really? Now, Mr. Mr. Dershowitz. No, no, I then, I, what's your point? Is, it, then is it a correct quote? quote? Let is, me finish, no, Mr. No, no, Dershowitz. No, no, make, I want to ask we you a question. Have a, is it a direct, is it an I'm, accurate okay. quote of Twain? Uh, Did Twain say uh, what Professor I Dershowitz. quote him as the way we, the way Isn't this wild? Isn't this wild? That's not the point, Alan. That's not the point. The point is, it's really weird that you and this other person published books with that quote in them Right, because yeah, anybody can quote Mark Twain. It's not a big deal. And then you, you, somebody quoting Mark Twain doesn't mean that nobody else can, you know, use that quote, right? But the ellipses are in the same place. If the jacket fits, we can have, let me finish. the way we can have, a, if the jacket fits, chat, discussion here is that mm -hmm. each person will get a chance right. to you make their point and a, won't be cut off. So you have a nearly a full page quote from one William Young, mm -hmm. a British consul from May 1839. Is it an accurate On quote? page eight? I'm going to finish, sir. Mm -hmm. It's On not the issue of your book. I turn to Joan Peters, page 184, the identical quote. With the ellipses, I'm holding it up for the camera. Perhaps they can see. This is the length of the quote. The is ellipses, it an accurate quote? The ellipses in the identical place. Last point. I'm not going to go through chapter two where there are 29 plagiarisms from Joan Peters. Wait, 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 let's be very clear. It is not plagiarism yeah, to quote Mark Twain yeah, correctly. Yeah, except, That's not except plagiarism. I mean, you can see an example here of what utilizing rhetoric to try to wriggle out of some inconvenient facts looks like, right? Oh, but did I get the Twain quote right? Did I miss the Twain quote? Did I, did I, you know, mischaracterize? Did I, you know, uh, did I have Mark Twain saying something that he didn't say? Did, you know, is there an error? No, there's no, there's, that's the accurate Twain, Twain quote. And so therefore, what could your pos problem possibly be? Cite Mark Twain and not Joan Peters. I'm a professor, sir. I know what plagiarism is. And plagiarism uh, sir, is. Well, and this was before the uh, professors could, like, you know, utilize, like, the Internet to sort of, uh, you know, suss out plagiarism. Let's hear your definition Listen, of plagiarism. No, we're not going to get involved no, no, with that get, now. So you're using a I word. mean, the Internet existed, but maybe not in the same way that it does now. I'm going to give it. the documentation, and you know what? We'll let everybody else decide for themselves. Because okay. the documentation... One last example, and I want to make it very clear. In Joan Peters' book, From Time Immemorial, she coins a phrase. The phrase is, turn speak. And she no, said... No, no, she borrows it from... No, she borrows sir, it from... from um, who sir, is it? Sir, oh, I'm sorry. No, she attributes it and borrows sir, it from somebody else. I'm it's not sorry. her own phrase. She coins the phrase... You see, you don't know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and that's pretty it's not terrible. Her she coined the phrase, turn speak, and she says... She's using it as a play off of George Orwell, mm -hmm. which, as all listeners know, used the phrase newspeak. Right. And she coined her own phrase, turn speak. You go to Mr. Dershowitz's book, he got so confused in his massive borrowings from Joan Peters that on two occasions, I'll cite them for those. Yeah, so this is wild. Like I said before, a lot of these, um, you know, kind of talk shows, um, they they are also functioning as ways for authors to uh, promote their works, promote their books. But in this case, like, and I've never seen this happen before or since, right? Where the book itself becomes the subject of controversy, right? The book itself, the the you know, this is uh, essentially um, what. Uh, Norman is talking about is Dershowitz's new book and saying that it is heavily, heavily plagiarized and that the sources that it's plagiarized from are, are wrong. To have a copy of the book, on page 57 and on page 153, he uses the phrase, quote, George Orwell's turn speak. Mm -hmm. Turn speak is not Orwell, Mr. Dershowitz, you're the Felix Frankfurter Chair at Harvard. Yes. You must know that Orwell would never use such a so, You know, example one, exhibit one, if you will, right, on, on this trial of Alan Dershowitz's new book, uh, that he has the same quote that Joan Peters uh, used on, on the same subject in, in her book. And it's got the same ellipses. So in other words, ellipses, um, you know, when you're going to quote 
uh, Mark Twain and it's like a page long quote, but you only want the first paragraph and the last paragraph, you put a little ellipsis in the middle, right? And you, you, you indicate that there's more there, but like, I'm not talking about that part. I'm talking about these two paragraphs, right? So he's got the same ellipses in the same places, right? As, as, uh, you know, her book second is a, you know, really silly, let's just say it that way, a silly mistake for an academic to make in terms of Mix, mixing up the um the, the phrase from Orwell, right? Badly, you know, butchering Orwell, right? And it's just kind of weird that it's it, it, although you know Dershowitz is accusing him, uh, you know, essentially implying that you know the, this is defamatory speech, right? And that like you know how dare you make these claims? Like I know that's not true. I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't plagiarize shit. But like you know, we we we're seeing this same obvious mistake in both works right and this is he's he's talking about like 16 examples 16 similar examples and uh yeah i mean this is a famous controversy so famous that it is it's got its own wikipedia page um and uh the, i mean this is i guess kind of where it all came to a head in front of yeah uh joan peter's book T from time immemorial And in which, you know, Dershowitz or which uh, if Finkelstein, I think, has has, you know, like indicates that he has um, debunked Joan uh, Peter's book. And, and that's why he recognizes it so well. He's, he's you know, had to contend with this text before. Uh, and, you know, his contention is that it's that it's wrong, that it's sloppy. It's it's it's, you know. It's not good. And here he's finding Dershowitz with the same stuff in his book, the same mistakes, the same errors, and, and not even an attempt to, to cite, you know, Joan Peters as a source. So yeah, this is the original um, Dershowitz versus uh, Finkelstein. And, you know, it's a bloodbath. It's a, it's a blood, it's an absolute, uh, you know, Dershowitz just gets, gets wrecked, gets embarrassed on national TV. And this definitely made some enemies for Norm Finkelstein. He will spend, I don't know what the next, you know, what would this be like, you know, 15 years of his life in uh, the wilderness? Uh, you know, she, he's on Democracy Now!, which isn't the biggest platform, but, you know, he's recognized as a scholar. He should have some access to, to some platforms and, and he doesn't. Right. He he literally like disappears. And, you know, the, the, the only people that will have him on, I think, were like, was it like gray zoners or something like that? This is where Norm's like feeling of victimization comes from. Right. This is why Norm, uh, this is why Norm resonates so heavily with the idea of cancel culture. And, uh, you know, like I said, um, you know, I, I tend to agree with him on uh, a lot of his takes on Israel, Palestine, but there's some other takes that I, I, I massively disagree with him on. And a lot of that comes from this kind of uh, camaraderie of the accused that he felt for, for other quote unquote canceled um, figures. But I mean, like, unlike a lot of these people like Destiny who bitch about cancel culture, oh my God, Demon Mama's going to say I'm transphobic or whatever. Um, Norm actually was, you know, academically and, and otherwise blacklisted in, in no small part uh, because of this. Um, yeah, in September 2006, and I'm reading from Wikipedia here, Mr. Wikipedia. Uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, sent uh, members of DePaul University's law and political science faculties what he described as a dossier. Yo! Oh my God, Norm, I gotta stop. I, I, I gotta stop, you know, relating to him so hard. Wow. Wow, wow. Let's just say the chat that I've, I've, I've dealt with my own uh, Dershowitz, right? A dossier of Norman Finkelstein's most egregious academic uh, sins, especially his outright lies, misquotations, and distortions that are not incidental to Finkelstein's purported scholarship. They are they are Finkelstein's purported scholarship. So he is, in essence, he's trying to turn, um, you know, he's trying to turn Norm's expose of him, like around on him, and because he's got. Because he's got clout, essentially, he's able to, you know, he's able to, you know, effectively. I, I think Norm got denied tenure because of this and, and you know, it really. Let me see. OK, so here we go. 
they are, they are per Finkelstein's purported scholarship, and he lobbied professors, alumni, administrators to deny Finkelstein tenure. DePaul's political science uh, committee investigated the accusations against Finkelstein and concluded that they were not based on legitimate criticism. Indeed, they were, you know, salty, angry <laughs> rantings of, of a, a guy that Finkelstein had, had exposed, right? A uh, department subsequently invited John Mearsheimer and Ian Lustig, two in uninvolved academics with expertise on Israel-Palestine, the Israel-Palestine conflict, to evaluate the academic mer merit of Finkelstein's work. Mearsheimer and Lustig came to the same conclusion. In April 2007, the DePaul University Liberal Arts and Science Faculty Governance Council had voted unanimously to send a letter to Harvard University expressing the council's dismay at Professor Dershowitz's interference in Finkelstein's tenure. So Dershowitz at the time, I believe, is teaching at, at Harvard. That's why uh, the council's uh, doing this. So yeah, like they they look at the charges, they and they're like, this is, this is bogus. What what the fuck is this? Why is this guy trying to? So in early two thousand seven, the DePaul University Political Science Department voted nine to three, and the College of Liberal Arts Science uh, Personnel Committee five to zero in favor of giving Finkelstein tenure. Three opposing faculty members subsequently filed a minority report opposing tenure, supported by the dean of the college, Chuck uh, Sukar. Sukar. Uh, stated he opposed tenure because Finkelstein's personal and reputation demeaning at attacks on Alan Dershowitz, Benny Morris, Benny Morris shows up in this, right? And uh, Holocaust uh, authors Elie Wiesel and uh, Jerzy Kaczynski were inconsistent with DePaul's Vincentian. What is Vincentian values? Okay. Uh, American Catholic research outfit, DePaul University, and it promotes, wait, the Vincentian Studies Institute of the United States? What the fuck did they mean? Vincentian Val... Okay, whatever that means. Right, in June of 2007, a three to four vote by DePaul University's board on promotion and tenure, faculty board, affirmed by the university's president, the Reverend Dennis Holtschneider, denied Finkelstein tenure. Finkelstein was placed on administrative leave for the 2007 to 2008 academic year, the remainder of his contract with DePaul, his sole course, his sole course having been canceled. Yeah, how much does it suck that you 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 signed up for Finkelstein's course and you were like really looking forward to taking it? It gets canceled. Um, however, in announcing his decision, Holt Schneider said the outside attention was unwelcome and inappropriate and had no impact. I'm sure on uh, either the process or the outcome of the case. On September 5th, 2007, Finkelstein resigned after he and the university reached a settlement. They released a joint statement on resolution of the conflict. Anyway, wow, this is this is where this goes. So I, anyway, I don't want to sidetrack us too much, uh, but this is unbelievably interesting. And uh, that's, you know, if you want to see this, um, God, I should just copy the link, shouldn't I? Okay, I'm going to put it in Twitch chat. I'm going to put it in both YouTube chats. If anybody wants to check this out, uh, not right now, of course, because you're watching me. But uh, later, you know, save, save this address if you want to see the entire uh, entire thing. Actually, we might do it for a premium streamium. Yeah, hold that thought. We might we might actually like this. This sounds like the perfect. Um... Sounds like the perfect subject for a premium streamium phrase as turn speed. I like it. I think it's a well, very elegant I, well, phrase. Well, maybe you like yeah, it. And evidently, Joan Peters... And if you want to be part of that premium streamium when it happens, right, uh, all you need to do is either make yourself a member on YouTube, a uh, sub on Twitch, or a uh, uh, or sign up for my Patreon, right? Uh, get in while the getting's good, right? Because right now, I don't think we have any like different levels. Most people do levels of Patreon. I'm just like whoever's in the Patreon. You know, that's probably the 
the cheapest way to get in if you just are, are interested in this yeah um those are you know th those are the ways that you uh you can see the premium streaming of course i try to make it available to as many people as uh want to watch it if there's somebody that uh, just has no way to um you know get in I'll, I'll figure out a way to uh to sneak them into the premium streaming uh nonetheless but yeah those are the main ways that you can get it um on youtube of course you can become a sub possibly for free by using twitch prime you give the you, you get a free uh sub give it to the streamer of your choice if that happens to me you will no longer see ads in my chat you will get weasels and you'll get the premium streamium and uh on uh you could also possibly be gifted a uh you could also possibly be gifted a sub although that's more likely to happen if you're active in the chat because that way people will see that you don't have a sub and somebody might take pity on your soul and want to save you from that ad break that's pretty generous and uh i hope you appreciate it i know i definitely appreciate it because uh every sub every membership uh helps support the stream uh so as does uh do super chats super stickers uh donations the uh the link is down in the description as well as the link to my patreon and uh throne if you want to help support the stream by uh helping building better a uh, better tech setup like uh maybe for instance uh, a microphone that's xlr rather rather than usb that's what i'm uh, crowdfunding over there liked it mm -hmm. but george orwell never heard of it to the best of my knowledge we have to break okay. for let, station. Let just one sec just one sec really? no it's a station break you can't do it you can't do it alan you don't have an override right yeah they're they're kind of like this is you know they're on radio i i think and uh yeah, their station breaks are pretty hard breaks. So anyway, this is round uh, two of uh, Finkelstein uh, versus Dershowitz, right? After um, Norm exposed Allen as not just um, being a plagiarist, but of being a plagiarist of sloppy research. And uh, Allen uh, strikes back at him by essentially getting him, you know, getting his tenure uh, making sure his tenure doesn't happen and, and essentially, you know, blacklisting him. Uh, yes, uh, and and yes, uh, I, they felt it and they were wrong to feel it. I have to go back just 10 years earlier. 1947-48, the Peel Commission was set up by Great Britain. It recommended dividing the mandate into a tiny little sliver of land uh, along the Mediterranean for a Jewish state where there was a Jewish majority and the Jewish majority would determine how that was governed. Uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the leader of the Palestinian people, said, rejected it. He said, there's no such thing as the Palestinians. We're just greater Arabs. And, uh, and, and we don't want there to be a Palestinian state. We just want there not to be a, a Jewish state. And then in 1948, the UN divided, uh, again, giving the vast majority of the arable land, the land that's usable, to the Arabs. The, again, the Israelis accepted it. The, Arabs rejected it. Again, there was a Jewish majority in the area that was set aside for Israel. The Arabs attacked in a genocidal war and tried to destroy Israel. The key point may have been motivated by fear is that the Arab and Muslim... Uh, so, yeah, the... Wait, did we... Oh, my God. I'm starting us in the middle of this. I don't know if that's okay. Um, there is... I, I think what we missed... Let me just, like, rehash what Pierce says. Uh, he essentially says that there's a great deal of discourse on the fact that what is going on now in Gaza did not start on October 7th. What does that mean, though? Let's unpack that with our two guests, Alan Dershowitz and Norm Finkelstein. So that that's essentially. Um, does Norm talk first, though? Dershowitz, would you actually disagree with that in terms of an assessment of how this made Palestinians feel? And were they wrong to feel it? I wouldn't just... <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, and, and yes, uh, I, they felt it and they were wrong to feel it. I have to go back just 10 years earlier. 1947-48, the Peel Commission was set up by Great Britain. It recommended dividing the mandate into a tiny little sliver of land uh, along the Mediterranean for a Jewish state where there was a Jewish majority. And Wait, was the chief motor of Arab resistance to Zionism. I think the problem... ...in the catalyst for what follows. So, Norman Finkelstein, let me start with you. Just outline, from 1947, what happened then that you believe 
sorry, chat. He goes to Norman first, and then he goes to Alan. And I just wanted to not miss um, Norman's opening. Created really the problem that followed. I think the problem that followed can be very easily summarized by two statements of the chief Israeli historian, Benny Morris. Statement number one, he said in his comprehensive history of the conflict, he states, one, that the fear of Arab displacement and dispossession was the chief motor of Arab resistance to Zionism. His second statement is the idea of transfer, which is what the euphemism for expulsion, the idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. That to me is the starting point. The fear, the rational fear of the Palestinian people that should the Zionist idea be realized, it would result in their territorial dispossession and displacement. It's no different than the fear of our own, meaning the U.S., Native Americans, that the success of the Euro-American enterprise in the United States would be at the expense of our Native population. The fear, the rational fear, of territorial displacement and dispossession. Okay, that's very clear. Alan Dershowitz, would you actually disagree with that in terms of an assessment of how this made Palestinians feel? Oh my God, chat. First, my cat had to pee. Now I have to pee. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have my earphones on and I'm gonna be listening. I don't want to miss anything here. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to uh, pee in record time. And. Uh, So I won't really miss anything, but until then, until then, I'm going to wait. That's not the right image. Where is the right image? Oh my God, chat, I can't find, I can't, uh, I can't pee until I find the right Homestuck troll. There it is. I leave you in the capable hands of one Vriska Serkut. And over there, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to keep playing this uh so that it doesn't get boring while I am peeing. Hopefully, uh I I did not just like hear the bathroom door uh shut and somebody beat me to the bathroom. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing the pee-pee dance here with Vriska uh in a second, but hopefully I'll be able to pee. Hopefully that's not uh that's not a bridge too far. Uh anyway, I will be uh right back. And were they wrong to feel it? I wouldn't just <clears throat> uh, yes uh, and and yes, uh I they felt it and they were wrong to feel it. I have to go back just 10 years earlier. 1947-48 the Peel Commission was set up by Great Britain. It recommended dividing the mandate into a tiny little sliver of land. Uh, along the Mediterranean for a Jewish state where there was a Jewish majority and the Jewish majority would determine how that was governed. Uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the leader of the Palestinian people, said, rejected it. He said there's no such thing as the Palestinians, we're just greater Arabs and, uh, and, and we don't want there to be a Palestinian state, we just want there not to be a, a Jewish state. And then in 1948, the UN divided, uh, again, giving the vast majority of the arable land, the land that's usable to the Arabs. The, again, the Israelis accepted it. The Arabs rejected it. Again, there was a Jewish majority in the area that was set aside for Israel. The Arabs attacked in a genocidal war and tried to destroy Israel. The key point may have been motivated by fear is that the Arab and Muslim uh, people desperately didn't want there to be a Jewish entity. For the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, it was religious that under uh, Islamic law, you can't give any land that was Muslim land over to a Jewish land. And then since that time, 1967, uh, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007, Israel has been willing to accept a two-state solution. And every Arab leader has rejected it. And 
Israel abandoned the, the Gaza Strip uh, in 2005, took out not only every living person, but every dead person who was buried, left behind hothouses and agricultural equipment. Yes, they had to protect their borders, and they only had the blockade, the major blockade, after Hamas took okay. over in a we're bloody a little bit, the Palestinian stop you there, Authority. We're getting a little bit ahead of where I want to get to at the start of this debate. Sure. Um, you've outlined your response to, to what Norman said there. Norman, in 1948, we had the NABCA, the catastrophe, as Palestinians call it. It's because the UN <clears> couldn't get people to agree to the proposal. Israel declared itself a state. War broke I mean, out. that was pretty fast. Uh, Israel gained more land, I think this is uncontestable, than the UN originally assigned, mm -hmm. and many Palestinians were forced out of their homes. Wait, who's eating it's a mint? But at the same time... I hear crinkling. Who just got out a candy or a gum or something? Many Israelis were forced out of... Is that of, you, Norm? Or many Jewish people were forced out of their homes in Arab uh, countries. So there was a lot of displacement going on on both sides. And I would ask you, out of, or many Jewish people were forced out of their homes in Arab uh, countries. So it's also true that at the same time, many of and I think this is uncontestable, than the UN originally assigned... Mm -hmm and many Palestinians were forced out of their homes. It's also true that at the same time, many Israelis were forced out of, or many Jewish people were forced out of their homes in Arab uh, countries. So there was a lot of... Wait, also, what's the deal? Now, He's... Yeah, we have a little bit... Ooh, I want to stop you there just we're getting a little... They had to protect their... We'll ...get to at the start of this debate. No, so, I need to see you know, where this... Was this a mint? What happened? I got to see, like, we got to keep score of who's eating what. Your response, including to me, said there. Norman, in 1948, we had the NABCA, the catastrophe, as Palestinians call it. It's Did he just say NABCA? It's called the NAKBA, but the UN <clears throat> couldn't get people to agree to the proposal. Israel declared the NAKBA. itself a state. War broke out. Uh, Israel gained more land. I think this is uncontestable than the UN originally assigned. Wait, wait, wait. And many Palestinians were forced out of their homes. Who's getting a breath so mint? That at the same time. Many I, see, I see Norm like swallowing there. I think he's kind of dehydrated. Maybe he needs a. Of, or many Jewish people were forced out of their homes in Arab uh, countries. So there was a lot of displacement going on on both sides. And I would ask you, if you look at that in totality, some people have said to me, you know, if you actually go back to this period in time, both sides have a legitimate cause. Oh, thank you. Jules has got the information about um, Vinci Vincentism, Vincenti Vincentian values. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul. Okay, the person the university is named after. Uh, it follows the rule of the that order of priests. So the Vincentians? It's like, kind of like the Jesuits or something, but I mean, not like the Jesuits. You know, no, nothing's like the Jesuits. The Jesuits are their own thing, right? But I just mean like it's an order like the Jesuits are in order? Or complaint. Would you agree with that? I don't really understand, like, the wider policy. I, like, I, I, I really am, like, lost. I can't agree with that because we have to stick. That's the one reason I could have never been Catholic. It is too complicated. Hard and fast to the factual record. The factual record is fairly clear on what happened in 1947 to 49 in the case of Israel and Palestine. Roughly 750,000 Palestinians uh, from what became the state of Israel were either expelled or fled in fear and ended up refugees. Now, it's important to keep in mind, Piers, because you and I think generously agreed to talk about the background. Frankly, I think you're the first person. I've noticed willing to talk about the background. But one thing that Pierce is not willing to talk about is the top of the hour ad break. That is the ad break that hits you every hour at the top of the hour. The ad break that I always seem to forget to mention. We are now like a full 24 minutes. So peaceful up here. But now they're freaking communist invading radicals. radicals. Welcome in communist invading ra radicals. Good to have you, uh, Glitch Dash. Um, yeah, the, you know, ad break that happens to you every hour, right about on the hour. It's a little off this time, right? But it's, it's you know, it's pretty regular. It's once an hour and it's three minutes. Three minutes. That's a lot, a uh, lot of ads to watch. Sometimes even the same ads more than one time, right? And if you no longer want to be a part of that mess, you can get out of it uh, for free with a Twitch Prime sub or possibly for $5 if you do not have a Prime. 
or uh, maybe even through the generous gift of somebody looking to uh, help someone, help a, ch a fellow chatter out, right? That can happen, that does happen, but that's more likely to happen when you're active in the chat. And in case you think I'm forgetting you, uh, YouTube, you can uh, support the stream through Super Chats, through Super st Stickers, uh, through getting yourself a membership, which gives you a weasel. Remember, uh, subs and memberships both get you into the premium streamium and bestow upon you the gift of weasels. We are trying to get a one world weasel consciousness going. We are trying to uh, unite the weasels of the world. And uh, we can only do that if uh, more people get the weasel so they can post the weasels. And, and then, you know, I, I think something uh, something amazing might happen uh, potentially. But yeah, those are uh, two of the ways you can support me. Other ways are down in the description, whether it be through donations, uh, joining the Patreon or supporting the stream on Throne by literally like, you know, helping the uh, the tech uh, be better, be better than a uh, USB mic. Um, it's much appreciated and uh, also appreciated is hitting that thumbs up to like the stream. It's more powerful than you think. That 200 and about 270,000 of those powers. Uh, look at Dersh's face. He is doing it now. Wait, what's he doing? Indians who were expelled during the first uh, Arab Israeli war, they ended up in Gaza. So. Wait, did I get misdirected? Was it actually Dersh that had the mint? We want to take He's the looking at something. The point of departure, 1947 to 49, the point of departure for Gaza is exactly the same. That's how Gaza became Gaza. 70% of the population of Gaza were, became Palestinian refugees. Now, as to the question of what's sometimes called a population exchange between the Arabs who yeah, the crinkling in excuse me the Jews who Wait, is he gonna, he, I, I want him to be like excuse me Alan could you please stop crinkling I don't know who's crinkling I think it's Alan though Biden Alan's Arab looking at something versus the Arabs who resided in what became the state of Israel there really isn't I don't want to again involve now in a scholarly debate uh, because it's simply not the time and place but there isn't any good scholarship on what happened with those Arabs, Arab Jews in 1948. Some, like the Yemeni Jews, everybody agrees they came willingly. The, the question of the Iraqi Jews, it's kind of a blur what happened. I'm not going to take one position or another on it. But I don't think those other aspects of the conflict ought to... Uh, distract us from the fun yeah my understanding is the that that aspect of the conflict right the you know expulsion um uh of jewish people from different uh uh parts of of the world was done in response to what was going on in the palestine uh the question that you asked and i think it's a very good question to look at the background and the background to what happened, what happened on October... Doesn't make it right, but it's important to, um, you know, keep track of causality. Because this is a complicated affair, as uh, Norman just said. He's not even sure, you know, what exactly the situation uh, was in in Iraq, for instance. Over 7th... It but there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces here. Again, with the expulsion... The moon pie in his lap ain't gonna unwrap itself. Damn of about 300,000 Palestinians into Gaza. Chat, how many calories is a moon pie? Isn't it like, isn't it like 800, 900 or something? It's like ridiculous, right? And now they, comp they comprise about 70 to 80% of the- I feel like the moon pie is like the densest form that like human usable energy can come in, right? That you can't stack like, energy like metabolic energy any more densely than with the moon pie is essentially the singularity population am i right and their descendants okay well other dershowitz you're, you're disagreeing with with what you're or am doing. i thinking of a different snack cake altogether during there why look at ding dong maybe fundamentally the nakba was a self-imposed wound ben gurion when he announced the establishment of israel welcomed all the arabs to stay he didn't want to expel a single one but the Arab countries engaged in a genocidal war.
designed to kill every Jew and destroy Israel. It was as a result of that invasion that Palestinians left or were expelled. Now, I happen to have studied the situation with Iraqi Jews because I was one of those people who helped draft Resolution 242 at the United Nations. I feel like Norman is talking to somebody off screen. And we looked at great detail into the history of Jews in places like Iraq. In Iraq, there was a Nazi pogrom during the Second World War, and there were additional pogroms in other Arab countries in which Jews had no choice. Wait, I got to read this chat. Um... The sound, the crinkling, that's Norm deploying a debate tactic he used against Destiny, where he would occasionally dangle his keys. Yeah, I've heard that uh, that works against debate uh, bros alike. But to It's only 220 calories? Really? A, a whole moon pie? Leave. And there I mean, it's a big dessert, but... Much as there were in Sudetenland, much as there were in Pakistan and India, and every other country in the world, the refugees were incorporated, assimilated into the society. But UNRWA, this horrible, horrible organization, was set up to keep the Arabs refugees. Wait, are you sure that's not a serving? It's not like one of those things where they, like, if you look at the moon pie, it's like one serving is one third of a, of a moon pie or something like that? them in camps to make sure there was a festering wound. The Jews were integrated into society. No, they weren't first class citizens in the beginning, but now they dominate the country. The same thing could have happened to the Arabs who left Israel. They could have been integrated into the surrounding countries. Instead, they were kept in camps and told that they had to destroy Israel. They had to have a right of return. They had to go back. That history can't stop and you can't move forward you have to only i mean it's a weird way to characterize it right you know you're talking about families that uh left their homes with the understanding that they would be able to come back when it was safe and like some people like wore keys and in fact if i'm not mistaken some people still wear their their house key like around or their you know parents or, or grandparents house key around their neck as a you know like as a um as, as, as like a promise to return move backwards so the sole fault for the refugees was the attack by the arab countries designed to we need Israelis. that's when the a cosmic brownie yeah i feel like i should be doing like less i i should i feel like we need silly content Expulsions and the leaving. One pie so, is 220 before, calories. I was way off. Before I go back to leadership, before I go yeah. back to Norman uh, for response to that, yeah. from your understanding, how many Jewish people were displaced from their homes in this early period? Because I've heard it was you know, actually precisely, a lot. It was between seven and eight hundred thousand, with probably a trillion dollars worth of wealth. These were people who had lived in these countries longer than the Muslims. They had lived there since the Babylonian exile uh, 2,000 years earlier. They had been full citizens. A weird way to pronounce Muslim. They were Demis. They were second class because they were not, not Muslims. But they lived in peace. And he said, he, he happened, said Muslims that time. And, uh, many were expelled. Some left voluntarily. I can see that to uh, Mr. Finkelstein. But many left. About the same number were left voluntarily. Remember, too, with the Arabs, they were told to leave and they would come back victorious after. In Haifa, for example, many of them wanted to stay and many did stay. But the Arab leadership said, leave. Wait, we'll cosmic brownie is 510 per brownie? Wait, OK, is, was this not an edible? I thought you were talking about like an edible. Back victorious, you'll have everything back. This Cosmic brownie makes it sound like you're going to be like peeled off of the ceiling by the time you eat that thing. It's a complex situation. It's 75 years ago. There is a statute of limitations on things like this, a moral statute of limitations. Move on. Establish yourselves in the countries that you left and went to. Get rid of these refugee camps. Get rid of UNRWA and become full citizens of the countries you moved to the way my grandparents became full citizens of the United okay, States let me, let me go after to... pogroms had made them leave Poland. Okay. Wait, so the parallel here, like he's not saying it, but right by putting those parallel together, like it sounds, it's way too close to justifying the pogroms for my comfort. Let's just put it that way. Come to Norman Finkelstein, your response to that. 
Okay, thank you, Piers. First of all, as a general point, I agree with- Wait, is a, com a cosmic brownie not, like, infused with Sebe days and THCs? ...of a statute of limitations on your claims to a parcel of land. The first time I came across that expression was reading Arnold Toynbee's great history of the mo history of the world, actually. And he makes the point in his history... What is he doing? Isn't there a statute of limitation on the claims of Jews to Palestine? He said that claim was made 2,000 years ago. And it's claimed that, even today it's claimed that, based on what happened 2,000 years ago, there's a large portion of Israeli population who believes they have title to the West Bank, they have title to Gaza, because of that claim 2,000 years ago. Isn't there a I statute of limitations? Allow me to complete my thought, and then you can disagree. Isn't there a statute of limitations on the claim from two to 3,000 years ago? Now, yeah. Yeah. I want to focus on Gaza. I, want, I would like to focus on Gaza. The population is expelled from Israel into Gaza. Now... If you look at Benny Morris's history called Border Wars, he says that between 1949 and 1953, literally, listen closely, about 2,700 to 5,000 Palestinian expellees, that's including in the West Bank and in Gaza, between 2,700 and 5,000 Palestinian expellees were killed by Israel. Oh, wait, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, Cosmic Brownies. Wait, no, now I can picture the bag. Now I can picture the logo. Okay, sorry. For some reason, I was thinking it was something that I'd seen in a, like, a different kind of shop altogether, right? If you can get my drift. Turn home. Now, Benny Morris said... Okay, 90 is it a sign of my weapons grade ADHD that I cannot help but be distracted by the crinkle of wrapping paper? The crinkle of some sort of candy that I don't scent of those killed. I guess it could also be just like somebody's lapel mic, maybe that's what it, I'm hearing. Were unarmed. They were what he called economic infiltrates who wanted to see their homes. They wanted to see their land. They wanted to see their neighbors. They were brutally, if you believe Professor Morris, brutally murdered between those years. In 1956, as you know, peers, England, France, and Israel invaded Egypt, including at the time, Gaza. What happened then? According to Benny Morris <clears throat> in the book Border Wars, he said between 470 and 500 Palestinian men were lined up and shot down. Now let's bear in mind, Piers, this is long, long before this entity called Hamas. So when we're referring to the British and the French, I believe that we're talking about the Suez Canal incident. Into the picture. Now if we fast forward to 1967, after Israel occupies Gaza, there are new assaults on the people of Gaza, this time carried on by, at the time, defense, no, he wasn't defense, agricultural minister, Ariel Sharon. Now, without getting sidetracked, I do have to say, Professor Dershowitz, every time I listen to you, even when we debated each other in 2003, I guess, or 2004, I can't recall, you keep escalating your claims about having written UN Resolution 242 or contributed to the resolution. Professor Dershowitz, mm -hmm. I understand people have fantasies. And oh I understand God. that people have failings of memory as they get older. But Professor Dershowitz, when we had our original debate, you didn't even know who wrote UN Resolution 242. You had all these names. It was Lord Carradine. Anybody who was involved in the process would know that. 
So let's make, let's agree on one thing. We both, both of us should agree <clears throat> to only state facts. And if we have any doubts about the facts, let's set them aside and try to give viewers, listeners, as accurate a record as possible. We can disagree. But when you engage in your fantasies, it really, to me, is very disturbing and disorienting. OK. Well, let me ask Professor Dershowitz to, to, to respond. What if it's Pierce that has the mint? Well, first of all, let's get the facts straight. I was Arthur Goldberg's law clerk. Arthur Goldberg was the United States representative to the United Nations. He asked me to come down. I actually moved in with him at the Waldorf Astoria Tower. The Waldorf Astoria. Wait, there's so much history, right? Waldorf Astoria. That's like... Like, so many weird historical things. Like, it's, it's like Waldorf Astoria. On, on 242, yes, I confused the name Carrington with something else, but I worked closely. In fact, I was partly... Wait, does this have, does it have something to do with Watergate, too? I can't remember. Responsible for the words... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I worked on the matter. I didn't work with Lord Carradin. I worked with Arthur Goldberg. And together we managed to get rid of the word Palestinian before refugees in order to make sure that the resolution applied both to Palestinian refugees Pierce, and to this is Jewish pure refugees. Science fiction, well, which now I you're can easily now prove. You're now you're mm -hmm. interrupting me. So let me finish. This is a detail. It's a fact. Now, let's talk about what happened involving the Gaza Strip. I agree there's a statute of limitations. I'm opposed to any biblical claims on Israel. I believe Israel has a, a political and moral claim to the land. There have always been Jews living there from the time of Jesus and Mohammed to 1948. And wisely, the British decided for a compromise plan for, for division. And that plan was accepted by the Jewish and Zionist leaders. It was rejected by the Palestinians. And then, as you know, Israel tried to give the entire Gaza Strip over to Egypt, back to Egypt, during the Camp David Accords. It almost caused a breakdown in the Camp David meetings because the Egyptians... Oh, shit. Didn't want it. It's where the Waldorf salad comes from. Israel very reluctantly held on to it. And then in 2005, Israel abandoned the Gaza. And only when rockets and a bloody coup occurred did Israel respond by having border controls. Let me tell you one thing. They weren't strong enough. If there had been better border controls, Hamas would not have been allowed to bring in concrete, which it used to build tunnels, to bring in weapons, which it used to murder all these people on October 7th. So Israel was not strong enough. It should have had far better border controls as other countries had in comparable situations. And so one more point. Toynbee and, and, and Benny Morris both are regarded as kind of one-sided uh, 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 historians. There are claims uh, uh, that dispute both of them, particularly Toynbee. Toynbee was an overtly anti-Zionist historian who didn't believe that the Jewish people had any claim uh, to Israel. There's also a statute of limitations on that. And so let's move forward. And moving forward means potentially uh, a solution where Hamas is no longer in control of Gaza. Uh, remember, too, you're absolutely right, Norman. Uh, terrorism began way before Hamas. Terrorism was an essential part of the Palestinian leadership. The U.S., the Olympic uh, uh, massacres that occurred way before Hamas. Uh, the, the, the terrorism on airplanes, the blowing up of airplanes, the hijacking of airplanes. The problem is that the world rewarded terrorism and it's rewarding them again um, by allowing Hamas to free uh, hundreds of okay. people, legitimately many convicted and not all convicted, many convicted in exchange for a small number of completely innocent hostages. You can't compare completely innocent hostages with convicted murderers. OK. Look, Norman, respond to that. But also, um, I also want to move on... Yes, yes. Once, you've respo once you've responded to it, also move on, if you will, to the issue of settlements. Because one of the things I find 
hardest to have. You misgendered the dirge? Any sympathy with Israel about is the continued expansion of settlements. I agree. Uh, and in particular on the West Bank. And I think we may find some consensus here. But first of all, Norman, your response yeah. to uh, what Alan Dershowitz just said, but also then move it to settlements. Yeah, well, I would like to try to, you know, actually, I can bring it up to the settlements uh, on the case of Gaza. So I would like to just continue where I left off with, so to speak, at the risk of being boring, the timeline. And uh, I said in 1970, there were uh, atrocities committed in Gaza against the people of Gaza by the uh, agriculture, headed by the agricultural minister at the time, Ariel Sharon. In 1987, as you perhaps remember, Piers, the first intifada broke mm. out. It was a overwhelmingly, here I quote Danny Morris from his book, Righteous Victims, it was an overwhelmingly nonviolent civil resistance to the Israeli occupation. By 1990, three years after the beginning, or really two years, because it began on December 7, 1987, by 1990, Israel started to institute, again, I'm sticking strictly to Gaza, what it called a closure policy. And the closure policy was basically to seal off Gaza, okay? By 2002, 2003, if you read uh, Baruch Kimmerling, he was a senior sociologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. Now, you might say Baruch Kimmerling was a person of the left, and I will grant that. But then we have Giora Island. Giora Island at the time. Wait, Dershowitz. Yeah, you're right. Dershowitz was OJ's lawyer. OJ uh, Simpson, uh, rest in peace. Rest in something, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is his attorney from the famous uh, murder trial the head of Israel's National Security Council. Is this part do? Yes, exactly. He said in March 2003, and now... I was thinking about maybe watching part... Well, see, okay, so now I said it's part do, as in this is the second time that Pierce Morgan has had these two on his show to debate, but it's the third time that they've been involved in a major high-profile debate. The first time was actually back in 2003 on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. And uh, so, you know, I, I thought about maybe watching part one of the, well, we, we did watch um, part of the Amy Goodman thing, just to get a sense of like what the history of these two uh, was, right? Why the bad blood between um, Dershowitz and Finkelstein. And, you know, it goes back to that event where Finkelstein essentially exposes uh, Dershowitz and his academic dishonesty in, in Norm's words. I'm going to be very careful with my words, though, uh, when talking about uh, Alan, Alan Dershowitz, uh, lest I end up being named in a lawsuit at some point. But um, yeah, this it, essentially uh, he embarrassed, you know, Alan Dershowitz greatly. And Alan Dershowitz was able to use his his clout to to reach out and get Norman's tenure um, canceled like he was he was due to get tenure. He didn't get it, and you know, it was essentially due to um, you know Dershowitz's connections. I'm quoting him. He described Gaza as a huge concentration camp. So you can say there is a consensus among knowledgeable people. I am so curious about who has got the breath mint. Sociologist at the Hebrew University, head of the National Security Council, that Israel had turned Gaza into a concentration mm -mm. camp. In 2006, Wrong. in 2006, there is an election in January 2006. Hamas wins the election basically on the platform of reform because the Palestinian Authority is proverbially corrupt. It comes into power. Immediately as it comes into power, Israel institutes this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. And at that point, uh, uh, there have been various descriptions. I'm sure, Piers, you wouldn't disagree. You wouldn't call The Economist a left-wing magazine or anti-Semitic. It described Gaza as, quote, a toxic dump. And uh, at that point, it had a high, it, slowly, 
Just to give you one example, peers and your listeners, because they should have a sense of what this blockade looked like. Israel's explicit policy, its explicit policy was to keep Gaza on the precipice of economic catastrophe. That's how they described their policy. They prohibited baby chicks from entering Gaza. They pr prohibited chocolate from entering Gaza. They prohibited potato chips from entering Gaza. They prohibited any spices from entering Gaza. And it prohibited any exports from Gaza, except at some points, occasionally, things like strawberries. So what had happened to Gaza? It had on the eve of 2007, it had the highest unemployment rate in the world. It was about 60% unemployed, 50% uh, for the population as a whole, 60% for youth. The people in Gaza were left to languish and die. No past, no present, no future. To languish and die in the concentration camp. That was their prospect as of October 6, 2003. Excuse me. Yeah, 2023. Sorry about that. May I respond? Well, I'll tell you May what, I yes, respond? actually, I, actually, on that point, Professor Dershowitz, you respond. Mars Falcon says, over half the population of Gaza Strip are under the age of 18. None of them voted in that 2006 election that keeps on being, you know, cited as a justification for the atrocities um, being committed today. On to that point briefly, if, if you could. And then I want to come back to Norman Finkelstein to move it on to settlement. So, Alan, just respond to what... Uh, oh. I mean, to respond to that suggestion, sure. which has been cited by many people, that the conditions in Gaza in the period that Norman Finkelstein has been referring to have been described by many people as bordering on a concentration camp. And at the very least, a form of occupation where Israel wielded far too much control over what could come in and out of Gaza, including people. Well, they're right in the description that it was a toxic place. Uh, it was a toxic place because Hamas took over and because Hamas robbed the people of Gaza of their food. It took the material that was sent from Europe, from countries... Hamas robbed the people of Gaza of their food. ...trees around the world and took it away from the children and took it away from the hospitals, took it away from the schools and gave it to their fighters to build 350 miles of tunnels. Uh, imagine what could have been done. Um, imagine any like resistance situation in which you couldn't make that claim, in which you couldn't uh, say that, you know, that um, money or materials that were purposed for the, uh, for, for any kind of resistance were actually being taken out of the mouth of the starving population and you know in the case where there's an embargo where there's, there's a um there's a limit on, on what uh you know is being allowed to come into gaza yeah you're gonna have that kind of situation right it's it's kind of like that had been sent to gaza there was plenty of food in Gaza, except that Hamas was using it. There was plenty of material to build. To ensure that there's going to be a resistance based on how you're treating uh, the people there. And, you know, you ensure that you can accuse that resistance of, 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 of operating at the expense of whatever, whoever's suffering in, uh, in Gaza hospitals in Gaza, but instead Hamas was using it. It's Hamas that turned it into a, a toxic, toxic place. When Israel, in fact, uh, occupied it, actually occupied it, it was in much better shape than when Hamas took it over. And so it's Hamas's fault. Hamas turned Gaza into this horrible place. And let's remember, Israel has been prepared to give up Gaza over and over again. It tried desperately to give it back to Egypt in, in, during the Camp David. It tried desperately to allow for... And, and, I mean, there's so much just like, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I feel like uh, on one hand, like I'm surprised at Norm not pushing back at some of this stuff or not being able to, you know, get some traction uh, more uh, against this stuff. Um, I, I mean, like I can see what, what's going on here, right? What the, the claim... 
um, that's being made is, right, when he talks about the Camp David Accords, he's talking about a deal that included a poison pill. Like, there were stipulations in the Accords that were never negotiable, that were non-starters for, um, you know, the Palestinians. That is why they, those accords were not signed, right? They did not actually negotiate in good faith. They did not give them a deal that was even tenable, right? They offered a deal which would have ensured, um, you know, undermining any authority uh, that, was, that, that was held by the 